So what is BIDS? For over 40 years, the Philippine Institute for Development Studies or BIDS has been the country's foremost socio-economic think tank. It conducts rigorous and objective policy research and analyses that help the government in crafting relevant policies, plans, and programs in support of the country's long-term vision and development goals. PIDS pursues its mandate through three basic programs research, dissemination, and outreach. Through its research program, PIDS identifies and prioritizes studies, develops proposals, and conducts research on priority areas. The results of these studies are then disseminated through different platforms, publications, online resources, EIDS Corner Seminars and the Development Policy Research Month or DPRM held every September. To shed light on key policy issues, the advice and expertise of the Institute's research fellows are also sought by policymakers, government agencies, private sector, and civil society. Since 1977, BIDS has completed numerous policy studies on a wide range of development topics. This brand of service has then translated to policies and programs that have improved the lives of every Filipino. Philippine Institute for Development Studies Service Through Policy Research In need of references for your research? Do you want a digital library that you can access for free anytime and anywhere? You don't have to look far. Serpy is here for you. Serpy is an online database of socioeconomic materials produced by the Philippine Institute for Development Studies. Government agencies, research and academic institutions, and international organizations based in the Philippines. It is the country's first online repository of socioeconomic information. Created for policymakers and development practitioners, researchers, educators, and students. To access SERP, just visit the PIDS website and click the SERP widget or type serp pidsgovph SERP has a wide variety of materials such as journal articles, books, research papers, working papers, policy notes, audiovisual materials, and more. As of 2021, SERPI has more than 50 partner institutions contributing knowledge resources to the database. SERPI provides a comprehensive coverage of references encompassing 22 research themes, labor and education, gender and development, poverty, technology and innovation, trade and industry, and many more. You can search by keyword or author, publication type, research theme, or year published. Serpy has more than 7,000 publications and audiovisual materials that you can access and download for free. What are you waiting for? Visit Serpy now! Socioeconomic Research Portal for the Philippines, Innovating Knowledge Exchange and Policy Research. Dapat po munang alamin or matukoy ang pangunahing problema ng bansa upang mapagtuunan ng pansin at mabigyan ng solusyon. We should have a specific goals, um, do research, and make a policy that is fair for everyone. Walang problema sa polisiya. Iayos lang ang pagpapatupad. Bago patubas ang batas, pag-aralan muna gusto ng government. Two things, clarity and execution. Both, you need the communication, and monitoring, monitoring, monitoring. As simple as that. Mandato ng Philippine Institute for Development Studies, o PIDS, na gumawa ng mga pag-aaral at pananaliksik ng mga pulisiya at programa ng pamalaan at magbigay ng rekomendasyon sa mga mambabatas sa pagbabalangkas ng mga pulisiyang makakatulong sa ating bansa. 
sinusulo ng aming ahensya ang evidence-based policy making upang bigyan din ang kalagahan ng polisiya na batay sa datos at policy research na sumusuri sa tunay na kalagayan ng ating mga komunidad. Napakahalaga ng policy research, lalo na sa mga panahong dumadaan sa krisis ang ating bansa. Kapag polisiya ay pinag-aralan, susulong ang bayan! So what is PIDS? For over 40 years, the Philippine Institute for Development Studies or PIDS has been the country's foremost socio-economic think tank. It conducts rigorous and objective policy research and analyses that help the government in crafting relevant policies, plans, and programs in support of the country's long-term vision and development goals. PIDS pursues its mandate through three basic programs research, dissemination, and outreach. Through its research program, PIDS identifies and prioritizes studies, develops proposals, and conducts research on priority areas. The results of these studies are then disseminated through different platforms, publications, online resources, PIDS Corner Seminars and the Development Policy Research Month or DPRM held every September. To shed light on key policy issues, the advice and expertise of the Institute's research fellows are also sought by policymakers, government agencies, private sector, and civil society. Since 1977, PIDS has completed numerous policy studies on a wide range of development topics. This brand of service has then translated to policies and programs that have improved the lives of every Filipino. Philippine Institute for Development Studies Service Through Policy Research References for your research? Do you want a digital library that you can access for free anytime and anywhere? You don't have to look far. Serpy is here for you. Serpy is an online database of socioeconomic materials produced by the Philippine Institute for Development Studies. Government agencies, research and academic institutions, and international organizations based in the Philippines. It is the country's first online repository of socioeconomic information, created for policymakers and development practitioners, researchers, educators, and students. To access SERPI, just visit the PIDS website and click the SERPI widget, or type serp-p.pids.gov.ph. SERPI has a wide variety of materials such as journal articles, books, research papers, working papers, policy notes, audiovisual materials, and more. As of 2021, SERPI has more than 50 partner institutions contributing knowledge resources to the database. SERPI provides a comprehensive coverage of references encompassing 22 research themes, labor and education, gender and development, poverty, technology and innovation, trade and industry, and many more. You can search by keyword or author, publication type, research theme, or year published. SERPI has more than 7,000 publications and audiovisual materials that you can access and download for free. What are you waiting for? Visit SERPI now! Socioeconomic Research Portal for the Philippines, Innovating Knowledge Exchange and Policy Research. Dapat po munang alamin or matukoy ang pangunahing problema ng bansa upang mapagtuunan ng pansin at mabigyan ng solusyon. We should have a specific goals, um, do research, and make a policy that is fair for everyone. Walang problema sa polisiya. 
iayos lang ang pagpapatupad. Bago patubas ang batas, pag-aralan muna gusto ng government. Two things, clarity and execution. Both, you need the communication and monitoring, monitoring, monitoring. As simple as that. Mandato ng Philippine Institute for Development Studies o PIDS na gumawa ng mga pag-aaral at pananaliksik ng mga pulisiya at programa ng pamalaan at magbigay ng rekomendasyon sa mga mambabatas sa pagbabalangkas ng mga pulisiyang makakatulong sa ating bansa. Sinusulong ng aming ahensya ang evidence-based policy making upang bigyan din ng kalaghan ng pulisiya na batay sa datos at policy research na sumusuri sa tunay na kalagayan ng ating mga komunidad. Napakahalaga ng policy research, lalo na sa mga panahong dumadaan sa krisis ang ating bansa. Kapag pulisiya ay pinag-aralan, susulong ang bayan! Welcome to the PIDS webinar series. Before we start the webinar, we would like to give you a few reminders. For attendees, your microphone is muted upon entry. In case you have a question, the moderator will read it during the open forum. For those attending via Cisco WebEx, use the chat box located at the lower part of the screen. Click the chat icon, type your name and affiliation, and your question, and send to all panelists. You may send your questions while the presentation is in progress. The moderator will read them during the open forum. For Facebook viewers, at least two questions from the comment section will be read by the moderator during the open forum. We will moderate all questions to ensure that they are relevant to the scope of the presentation. Thank you for joining us and we look forward to your active participation. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our weekly webinar series here at PIDS, where we tackle development issues based on data and evidence. I'm Sheila Siar, and I will be your moderator. Friends, in our webinar today, we will revisit the 2019 National ICT Household Survey and learn some new insights from the analysis conducted by the PIDS team. We will find out how our current digital infrastructure development is impacting ICT access in the country and how disparities in education and digital literacy skills, as well as security concerns impinge on the use of ICT, ICT tools. We'll also look at how uh, other dimensions of ICT access and utilization 
um, can explain why, uh, despite the growing uh, use of uh, ICT tools, the benefits arising from this or the so-called digital dividends have not been inclusive. I now give the floor to our Vice President at PIDS, Dr. Marife Balias-Terras, to officially open our virtual event. Peng? Yeah, thank you, Sheila. Before we begin, I would like to acknowledge the presence of officials from different sectors. From the National Economic and Development Authority, Assistant Secretary Roderick Planta, Director Florante Iktiben, Director Bien Ganapin. From the Department of Labor and Employment, Assistant Secretary Dominic uh, Tutai. From the House of Representatives, Congressional Policy and Budget Research Department, Director General Romulo Miral Jr., Director Elsie Gutierrez, and Director Tina Pasaki. From the Senate Economic Planning Office, Executive from Planning Office, we have Executive Director Merwin Salazar, Banco Central ng Pilipinas Director Maria Teresa Duenas, Deputy uh, Department of Information and Communications Technology Director Maria Teresa Garcia, Department of Trade and Industry Director Lija Guevara, Department of Finance uh, Director An Angelica Sarmiento, Testa Certific Certification Office Executive Director Maria Susan de la Rama, Commission on Population and Development Acting Regional Director uh, Maria Dinadores Delicana. We also welcome from PIDS uh, our Board of Trustee, Dr. Gilberto Lianto. From the private sector, we have President and CEO of Ascent Incorporated, Mr. Rodrigo Salicius. From the academe, let me acknowledge the following uh, Director Yvonne Saliling of the University of Southern Mindanao and uh, Associate Director Eva Montero of the Northern Iloilo Polytechnic State University, Batad Campus. From the CSO, NGOs, INGOs, we have a UN Development Program Resident Representative, Selva Ramachadrun, United States uh, Agency for International Development, Chief of Party, John Garity, Foundation for Media Alternatives, Executive Director, Lisa Garcia, Philippine Software Industry Association, Executive Director, Ayn Im King. Let me also greet our friends from the media and other guests, colleagues from the government, academe, civil society, media, private sector, as well as those who are watching through the PIDS and SERP Facebook pages. The rapid advances in information and communications technology continue to create vast economic and social opportunities for developing countries like the Philippines. For one, ICT is a driving force for fast growing business, such as uh, electronics, business process outsourcing, and other internet based services. ICT has also enabled government to be more effective and efficient in the delivery of services and allow the public easier and convenient access to consumer services. However, with an even access to ICT during, due to economic, geographic, and technological factors, the distribution of ICT benefits across sectors is also asymmetrical to the disadvantage of the poor and the marginalized group. This has created a significant digital divide among and within communities exacerbating existing inequalities. The, the digital divide and other ICT related issues will be discussed in this afternoon's webinar, which features the PIDS study entitled Expanded Data Analysis and Policy Research for National ICT Household Survey 2019. The paper is authored by PIDS Senior Research Fellows, Dr. Jose Ramon Albert, 
Dr. Francis Mark Kimba and Dr. Al Cabruga, together with consultants Mary Grace Santos, former supervising research specialist Maureen Roselion, research specialist Jana Vismanos, research analyst Mika S. Uh, Munoz, and former research analyst Carlos Cabayro. The presenter, Dr. Jose Albert, will let us will tell us the government's response to make the internet accessible to all, especially in public places, and on how to develop the country's capacity to undertake e-education, telemedicine, e-commerce, and other digitally enabled systems. We will also hear from him some of the programs that support reskilling and upskilling of workers and promote meaningful use of online platforms, such as the digital workforce through the ICT Academy, scaled upskilling from ITBPM workers and digital, digital jobs PH. The government's effort is slowly paying off if we look at uh, UCLA's speed test global index report, the country's fixed broadband internet speed has shown improvement in recent months. According to a Business Mirror News article, the Philippines' fixed broadband speed increased from 71 Mbps in July 2021 to 72 Mbps in August this year. Out of 180 countries, the Philippines is now at the 63rd spot in fixed broadband speed. In the East in Asia Pacific, the Philippines is at number 14 for fixed broadband and 13 for mobile out of 46 countries. Meanwhile, it also landed on the fifth spot in both fixed broadband and mobile out of 10 countries in the ASEAN region. We'll know more about the country's ICT status from Dr. Albert as he presents the 2019 National ICT Household Survey results. The survey was conducted uh, in collaboration with the ICT in collaboration with the Philippine Statistical Research and Training Institute to help the government develop and evaluate ICT policies and strategies. Specifically, the study looked into the ICT access and use of communities in relation to the living conditions and livelihood of households, their knowledge and skills on ICT, and available ICT infrastructure and equipment in communities, among others. All of these can provide clues on the potential impact of increased ICT adoption in the country. And to enrich our discussion, we have invited as discussants Dr. Rogel Marie Sese, the chairperson of Ateneo de Davao University's Department of Aerospace Engineering and project lead of the Access Mindanao program. We also have among our discussants Mr. Joel Davao, president of the Philippine Cable and Telecommunications Association, and engineer Pierre Tito Gala co-founder of the democracynet.net.ph. Thank you uh, for accepting our invitation and it is an honor to have you at this event. So we also thank our viewers and I look forward to a fruitful discussion during the open forum. Uh, thank you all and uh, good afternoon. Thank you and good afternoon to you too, Dr. Ballesteros. So friends, before we proceed to the presentation, allow me to remind you about our house rules for those who are uh, uh, joining us the first time or who missed hearing the recording before we uh, started the webinar. So to join the open forum, uh, just use the chat box located at the lower part of uh, the WebEx screen. Just type your name and affiliation and your question and send it to all panelists or, or to everyone, not to a particular person. And uh, 
I will read your questions uh, during the open forum. And since we have limited time, please make your questions uh, concise. And for our viewers on Facebook, you're also welcome to participate in the conversation. Just uh, use the comment section and you can type your question there. And I will read up to two questions during the open forum. OK, so um, well, for all speakers, uh, just a gentle reminder to kindly observe the time limit. So we are giving our presenter up to uh, 35 minutes and each discussion up to 15 minutes. OK, so at this point, I now uh, invite uh, all of you to pay attention to our featured uh, study for this webinar. So Dr. Uh, Ballesteros has already mentioned the authors of this study, and you can see their names and faces on the screen. OK, and um, to reiterate, uh, they are Dr. Uh, Jose Ramon Albert, Dr. Francis Mark Kimba, Dr. Aubrey Tabuga, um, Ms. Uh, Marie, Mary Grace Mirandilia Santos, Ms. Uh, Maureen Ann Rosillon, Ms. Jana Flores Manos, Ms. Carlos Caballero, and Ms. Mika Munoz. Okay, and to present the study is Dr. Jose Ramon Albert. He is a senior research fellow at the IDS. He was uh, uh, the former uh, Secretary General of the defunct National Statistical Coordination Board, which was consolidated with other statistics offices into the Philippine Statistics Authority. He is also a member of various bodies and expert groups on statistics and related matters, including the United Nations Global Pulse Data Pri uh, Privacy Advisory Group and the Philippine Commission on Higher Education's Technical Committee on Statistics. He obtained his bachelor's degree in applied mathematics from uh, De La Salle University and, and his master's degree and PhD in statistics from the State University of New York at Stony Brook. His main research interests are on um, IT and innovation, education, social protection, poverty, big data, data mining, and ICT. To the floor, Dr. Albert, the floor, virtual floor is now yours. Uh, thanks very much. Thanks, uh, Sheila. Uh, as uh, was already mentioned, this work was done by a, uh, an entire team that I led. Uh, I won't anymore mention all their names because it was already mentioned both by Sheila and VP Peng. Uh, and, uh, and this research was commissioned to PIDS by the Department of Information and Communications Technology, or DICT. Here's a quick outline of my presentation. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, to begin with, I'll be presenting a brief discussion on the background of the study the conceptual framework, and the study methodology after which I will then move on to major empirical findings on the key themes of the study first and foremost, ICT development for promoting a more innovative and inclusive society. Second, ICT, gender, e-livelihood, and e-entrepreneurship. And third, digital infrastructure development. Let me just point out uh, before I start that you know um, the this this survey was done pre-pandemic. No? It was on 2019. So whatever we we say is still in a way old news no? uh, because we know that we, with the pandemic we also had experienced uh, we were forced to digitalize much more. So, anyways, uh, in this discussion, we'll be closing with some policy issues moving forward, and some of this may have already been addressed by the ICT. To begin with, uh, we know that digital technologies and other emerging technologies of the fourth industrial revolution have disrupted our ways of doing things, drastically changed business models, and the nature of work. But while digitalization has grown considerably, not everyone has benefited from development benefits from ICT. While internet use has been rising, still many are not connected to the net. And even if they are, they do not fully harness ICT. Prior to the onset of the novel coronavirus or COVID-19, the Philippines has had a robust broad-based growth and there was recognition that ICT infrastructure development would be needed to sustain economic activity, encourage investments, and lay the ground for further innovation. COVID unfortunately changed the economic landscape, but we still recognize that in a post-COVID world, 
ICT is likely going to be one of the dr main drivers of more economic activities in the country. Technology, however, can worsen inequalities. Hence, it is crucial to have policies that should make digital dividends inclusive. The government, through DICT, has put in place an ICT policy environment to hasten digitalization in the country. Many, many, many plans are laid out in the Philippine Digital Transformation 2022, including the e-government master plan. And the ICT has also led in the formulation of the National Broadband Plan. We also have in place a number of ICT regulations and policies. But amid all of these policies, we do have a major barrier for ICT development the dearth of many ICT statistics. We cannot expect to manage well what we do not measure. The Philippines, unfortunately, next slide please, has been suffering from a lack of availability of official statistics on ICT, especially on the access and use of ICTs by households and businesses. Many of these statistics are needed, very needed, to monitor our Philippine Development Plan and our success in attaining the Sustainable Development Goals or SDGs. Of the seven indicators on ICT among the 232 indicators for monitoring the SDGs, only one is available. The percentage of the population covered by a mobile network broken down by technology. For the results matrix of the Philippine Development Plan, only three out of the required 14 indicators are available. Such data gaps are contributing to the lackluster scores of the country in international benchmarking exercises, as these depend mostly on available data. The DICT, however, has taken a very positive step in addressing ICT data gaps with the conduct of the National ICT Household Survey, or NICTHS. This survey, as was mentioned, was conducted by DICT in partnership with the PSRTI. By the way, PSRTI is the sister agency of PIDS in NEDA. It is the first ever household survey in the country that focuses on ICT. It involved interviewing over 40,000 households. This survey was supplemented by information gathered from barangay leaders on the presence of telco services in the surveyed areas. There were three survey instruments, a community questionnaire, second, a household questionnaire, and third, an individual questionnaire. Our examination of the NICTH has revolved around several policy questions on first, ICT access, use, and from the standpoint of households and individuals and the communities where they reside. Second, ICT connectivity in relation to inclusiveness, digital skills, e-livelihood, and e-entrepreneurship and online protection in the country. And third, policies and strategies of the digital economy while ensuring that the digital dividends are inclusive. Our study on the NICTHS is guided by a framework of analysis based on the World Bank's 2016 World Development Report on Digital Dividends. It looks principally on ICT access of households and ICT use of persons within the households in as far as they promote inclusion, efficiency, and innovation. As I mentioned earlier, we sought to focus our analysis on three key themes. Can you go to the next slide, please? And the next part of our, my, the presentation will discuss these themes, though, of course, I don't have enough time to go into all details. You have to read the discussion paper. For each of these themes, we will, I'll try to give you a brief literature review, followed by the main survey findings. Now, as far as the first key theme is concerned, how ICT development promotes a more innovative, 
and inclusive society, let me point out that as of January of this year, as much as three-fifths of the world's population or approximately 4.7 billion people are using the internet. But that also means 40% or 3.1 billion are not connected to the net. In the Philippines, we can similarly see a big share of the population using the internet. But we also lament that not everyone is connected. And even when people use the net, most of the time they seem to be on Facebook, on social media. They're not harnessing ICT very well. Where, while ICT can be empowering and it can promote social good, unfortunately, it can also exacerbate existing inequalities. Advances in ICT and other frontier technologies of the fourth industrial revolution, which at the IDS we refer to as FIRE, are observed to have generated unprecedented enormous wealth in record time. But that wealth has also been largely concentrated around a small number of persons like Elon Musk. Companies and countries. In developing countries like the Philippines, where the lack of digital infrastructure and regulatory bottlenecks hamper broadband development, a big issue is that access to the net through mobile or fixed broadband seems to be very expensive. The 2019 National ICT Household Survey, next slide please, results reveal that less than half of Filipinos used the internet in the last three months during the when the survey was being conducted. 75% of Filipinos own a cell phone, at least as of that time, and 24% of households own the computer. When data are disaggregated by geographic location, education, and age of persons, we will find significant digital divides. For instance, internet use is much higher in urban areas, 57%, versus rural areas, 36%. We find lower device ownership, cell phones, computers, and lower quality of connectivity in rural areas and less metropolitan areas or regions such as Barm, Bicol, Western Mindanao, and Northern Mindanao, while higher proportions are found in NCR and neighboring Calabar Zone and Central Luzon. These survey results also indicate that older adults and persons with less schooling have low ownership and use of devices as well as access to the net. As far as digital skills are concerned, the NICTHS results reveal that we have very low digital skills in the country. Only two out of five Filipinos are digitally skilled. Having at least one of the ICT skills identified in SDG indicator 4.4.1, or the proportion of youths and adults with ICT skills by sex and type of skills. Across age groups, it seems that the youth aged 15 to 24 years old are much more ICT skilled than the all other age groups, although the youth also tend to use much more gaming than most among all computer-related activities. Between sexes, slightly more females, 41% of them are ICT skilled compared to 38% for males. But if we examine this in combination with age, we will see interesting nuances. For instance, we might see that the young population aged 10 to 24 years old, more females are skilled while among the working age and older adults, more males are skilled. Next slide, please. When we compare our skills with those of our ASEAN neighbors, oh my gosh, based on similar data found in SDG indicators, global database of the United Nations, we find that the Philippines lags among ASEAN members. We are only faring slightly better than Thailand in five out of six skills 
except on using basic arithmetic formulas in a spreadsheet. In other words, di tayo marun mag-excel. Now, next slide, please. According to We Are Social, the Philippines is the social media capital of the world. With nearly four hours media, the NICTHS results suggest that 94% of Filipino netizens use the internet for communications or social media. A far second and third among computer activities of netizens in the Philippines is accessing information at 44% and leisure or lifestyle at 37%. <clears throat> Meanwhile, online, online transactions, online transportation navigation, content creation, and professional search are not very common for Pinoy internet users. Of course, we have to remind ourselves that these data were prior to the pandemic, as I mentioned earlier. Next slide, please. Only 7% of Filipinos that do online, actually do online transactions, uh, and of which the purchase of goods and services is the most common activity at 21%. It's an activity of 27, 23% of urban residents and 16% of rural residents. As for online selling, it's found to be the least common online transaction. Also, Filipinos uh, they uh, they uh, they do online pay payments and online banking, but a lot rarer than online purchases. It seems cash is largely used in online purchasing or selling. 80% of online sellers and 72% of online sellers are using cash on delivery, COD. Uh, we, we refuse to use e-money. I don't know why. It's so easy, you know. But of course, new data from Google Temasex e-economy SEA report for 2020, and even um, now the new report suggests that we have had a big rise in the use of digital services in the Philippines, including e-banking and e-money. So it seems that was the unintended consequence of the pandemic. Now we're much we're using much more of digitalization. And ICTHS results also reveal that the majority, 42% of Filipinos, do not use electronic payments in online purchases, largely because of security concerns, especially in giving personal and, and uh, card details. Lack of awareness about e-payment is another reason for not using e-money. In the next slides, I'll be presenting findings on ICT and online entrepreneurship from a gender analysis lens. The literature suggests that there's actually a gender divide in ICT use in some countries. In South Asia and Sub-Saharan Africa in particular, women appear to be 8% less likely than men to even own a mobile phone and 20% less likely to own a smartphone. Studies also find disparities in skills. While ICT specialist skills are more present among male than female workers, though with the variation with depends on the industry. In a further probe into the gender dimensions in ICT, UNESCO in 2019 found that, interestingly, there's a gender ICT gender equality paradox. Countries with better achievements of gender equality, such as those in Europe, have the fewer share of a much fewer share of women who pursue skills needed for ICT jobs. And conversely, countries with low levels of gender equality such as those in the Middle East, have the largest share of women pursuing ICT degrees. In the Philippines, we actually did some work at PIDS for the Department of Science and Technology's Science Education Institute. We found that the gender gap, uh, that while there's a gender gap in the total number of people who finished ICT degrees, um, uh, it, this, this gender gap is a little bit small. However, the labor participation of women, 70% with ICT degrees, is 23 percentage points lower compared to men at 93%. Results of the NICTHS show that women appear to be at par at women and even to some extent in some aspects per outperform men. There are relatively more women, 81% than men, 77% who, who, who use a cellular phone, but there are no disparities found between men and women in internet and computer usage. 
more women than men even have online buying or selling accounts and a slightly bigger share of female internet users, 5%, are engaged in online selling compared to men at 4%. However, on average, male online sellers still are earning more than female sellers at 10,900 pesos compared with about 6,000 pesos for female uh, sellers. Among women, a uh, majority of online sellers are employed. Self-employed women and housewives comprise a sizable share of women sellers at 36%. We conducted some basic econometric modeling and observed that ceteris paribus, engagement in online selling is more likely for women, married persons, and more educated persons. Holders of ICT degrees are also more likely to enter into online selling. As a person becomes older, there's also a greater chance of engagement in online selling, but this reverses more old person. Those who live in rural areas are less likely to engage in online selling. The unemployed, self-employed workers, and students are more likely to sell online than employed persons. Homemakers are less likely to engage in online selling in comparison with employed workers. And now let me turn to digital infra issues. We should note that an integral part of the digital infrastructure is the internet and that different network segments, for instance, the international link, the backbone, middle mile, last mile, they all make up the value chain of internet connectivity. With the availability of data from the NICPHS, the infrastructure gap and digital divide in the country can be examined from a supply-constrained lens. NICPHS data suggests that cell signal reaches 92% of surveyed barangays with 3G technology, however, being the much more prevalent in rural areas. Despite near universal access to electricity, some communities, especially in BARM, have low access to telco towers fiber optic cable, and free Wi-Fi. Only a third of the barangays have a telecommunications tower located in their community. Urban barangays, 61%, have three times more telco towers than rural communities at 19%. Almost all of these towers, 95%, are privately owned. Among barangays without a telco tower in their vicinity, some may still have access to a cell signal. 4G reaches only 61% of all barangays, with urban barangays 83% having about twice as much more access compared to rural ones at 44%. Meanwhile, 3G is still prevalent in rural areas. Only 12% of all the barangays have access to free Wi-Fi. The government's in other words, the results, these results from the NICTHS are suggesting that the government's free Wi-Fi for all program is still very, 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 very far from achieving its goal to providing internet access nationwide. The relatively low number of free Wi-Fi sites is a symptom of a larger ICT infrastructure gap. Only about 29% of barangays have a fiber optic cable, FOC, network that's installed in their communities. 53% urban barangays, percent rural ones. Although fiber, fiber offers the highest bandwidth and reliability, but it's still primarily concentrated in urban areas because it's very expensive to deploy in areas with low population density. As regards internet service providers or ISPs, one in five barangays have no ISPs. All regions except Ilocos have more ISPs in urban than in rural areas. That 8% of barangays in Metro Manila do not even have ISPs shows that even that there is also a digital divide even within cities. Households 
we already mentioned earlier, have near universal access to electricity. This is consistent with the earlier result I mentioned about from the NICTHS barangay data and also results of the 2020 annual poverty indicator survey that's conducted by the Philippine Statistics Authority, another sister agency, NEDA. A significant portion of households still, however, for a lot of broadcast. Less than 2 million households are using a fixed uh, telephone. Only a quarter, 24% of households own a computer. I mentioned this earlier. With laptops, 66% as the most common type, followed by tablets at 39% and desktops at 25%. A quarter of households own a communal cell phone, 44% of which are in urban areas and 56% in rural areas. Only 18% of households have an internet connection. Majority of them are using fixed wired, uh, wired, uh, wired broadband connection. NCR has the highest proportion of these households at 33%, while BARM, believe it or not, has the lowest at 4%. On average, Filipinos are spending, Filipino households are spending 1,300 pesos monthly on their internet connections with much higher spending in urban areas, 1,400 pesos, than in rural areas at 1,000 pesos. Households without internet access subscriptions report that cost is the main bottleneck, whether of the internet subscription itself or of the equipment. Availability of internet is another barrier, especially in rural areas. As regards individuals' access to and use of digital infra, 9 out of 10 Filipinos have access to a television, which shows that TV is still going to be king, especially for the campaign. 4 out of 5 Filipinos have used a cell phone. The highest usage is among the young, aged 18 to 34. 1 out of 3 have used a computer. Half have used the internet in the last three months before the survey was conducted through largely a mobile phone at 85%. Internet usage is highest in Luzon among major islands and highest in the national capital region, 66% among regions and much higher in urban areas, 57%. Finally, we turn to some policy issues and suggested ways forward. And you go to the next slide, please. Next slide, please. Okay. Uh, all right. So we, despite being in the digital age, I think you can go back a little bit. One slide before that. Okay. Um, we turn to these policy issues. Uh, clearly, this might be in the digital age. Many of our policies in the country are pre-digital. Can you imagine? We still want to keep even signing physically, no? <laughs> rather than having use a, uh, a digital signature. The NICTHS data shows that ICT access is still far away for many of our countrymen and a key policy thrust on ICT development thus should be on improving coverage and quality of connectivity. And I hope this becomes a, a, a campaign issue. The program such as the National Broadband Plan in public places, it's important monitoring of rural and um, remote communities for these programs. Uh, we should also be working uh, for improving digital liter literary skills. Um, the DICT can partner with other government agencies and the private sector to spread much more information about the importance of digitalization. The internet, ICT, and all these uh, technology empire, cybersecurity among the citizens. Filipinos should also get engaged not just in social media, but also in e-commerce and digital finance. Citizens, however, must be informed about the safe use of the internet, cybersecurity, and related matters. Still into the subject of digital literacy, next slide please, we ought to pursue policies for reskilling the workforce, particularly in improving digital skills. And it's essential that the gap of ICT skills and usage between the youth 
and older people between the educated and the less educated be bridged. We need to carefully examine our ICT skills gaps and how ICT skills may be harnessed fully. Specifically, some re behavioral research. Uh, I think we can go to the next slide. Slide, yes. Um, some behavioral research will be needed to uncover how can we incentivize people so that we can use ICT effectively. We need to also address issues that constrain people's ability to take advantage of online platforms. Efforts must be made to streamline access to formal institutions and its processes such as digital banking and online government transactions. Furthermore, improvements in ICT infrastructure should enable greater ICT usage for everyone, help maximizing the benefits that can be reaped from digital platforms. Despite the widespread cell signal coverage and mobile device ownership, internet usage in the country remains very low owing to poor and expensive internet connectivity and inadequate digital infrastructure, especially outside the national capital region. The NICTHS results show that, the con that connectivity problems in the Philippines is caused mainly by our analog era policies and laws, such as the radio control law, the Public Service Act, and the Public Te Telecommunications Policy Act. Government investments in digital infrastructure must target network segments and areas where the market fails to deliver. The government may also consider investing in areas where the private sector has difficulty competing and making a profit. However, the most critical role of the government is to introduce and enforce policies to address the accessibility, affordability, and quality of the internet. Outdated laws have stifled the growth of ISPs by restrict restricting network building to enfranchised telecom companies only. Government should remove regulatory barriers and expand market opportunities to allow players to invest, build, and innovate regardless of size, ownership, and technology. Republic Act 7925, which promotes local exchange or landlines, can you imagine, should be changed in the wake of the emergence of new digital technologies. Radio spectrum is also currently assigned only to telcos and mobile network operators. That has to change. Fast tracking the passage of certain laws that are pending in Congress, such as the Open Access and Data Transmission Act, or House Bill 8910, and the Better Internet Act or Senate Bill 1831 can help address the digital infra gap. House Bill 8910 allows more players to participate in building broadband networks. Meanwhile, Senate Bill 1831 introduced rules to in ensure internet service reliability and quality of service metrics. The executive and legislative branches should work to pass these laws with urgency, bilis kilos, as they say. You know? It's essential to introduce internet op uh, connectivity laws such as the Open Access in Data Transmission Bill. These bills can address the demands of the digital age, make the country competitive, and use ICT to achieve economic recovery coupled with sustained, inclusive wealth creation. Finally, we suggest that the ICT regularly conducts the NICTHS, preferably every two or three years, and improve on the current survey design and implementation, including, for instance, collecting data on assets so that we can analyze the digital divide between the poor and the non-poor. The survey should also have much more than one respondent per sampled household, and also, preferably involve more parties and experts to improve the questionnaire design. We also recommend the ICT keep updated about international statistical standards, particularly in measuring ICT development. 
Furthermore, the DICT can work together with PSA towards experimenting with digital skills measurement to check with the possibility of merging this measurement within functional literacy, which is uh, done in the functional literacy education and mass media survey of the PSA. This ends my talk. Thank you. And thank you very much, uh, Dr. Albert, for your uh, lively and uh, comprehensive uh, presentation. Indeed, the results of uh, the National ICT Household Survey 2019 are very telling. And uh, we greatly appreciate your um, um, recommendations and uh, uh, on how we can uh, move forward and address uh, the gaps in ICT use. ICT access and utilization. Okay, friends, uh, let us continue the conversation. And this time, we will hear from our invited experts, their insights on the study's findings and recommendations. And as Toots, uh, Dr. Albert has pointed out, the digital divide in the country remains uh, substantial. There are still many individuals and households, especially those in the rural areas that are left behind. And one of those areas is Mindanao, particularly the Bangsamoro Autonomous uh, Region. And our first discussion is actually uh, working towards reaching out, reaching the last mile in Mindanao, and getting isolated areas connected to the internet through uh, satellite technology. And we are honored to have with us Dr. Ro Rohel Marie Sese, who is a member of the Board of Trustees and the Chairperson of the Department of Aerospace Engineering of the Ateneo de Davao University. He is also the Program Leader of the Ateneo de Davao Community Connectivity Empowered by Satellite Services for Mindanao or Access Mindanao, which is a research and advocacy program of the Ateneo de, de Davao University that aims to provide internet connectivity to remote and isolated areas in Mindanao using satellite technology. Dr. Sessa led the National Space Development Program, which crafted a Philippine space development and utilization policy and proposal for the creation of the Philippine Space Agency, which eventually became Republic Act 11363, or the Philippine Space Act, the country's first space law. He has also worked with the private sector and served as a consultant of the Philippine Navy, Philippine Air Force, and the Department of National Defense for several years. Dr. Sessa, the virtual floor is now yours. Thank you, Sheila. Uh, pleasant good afternoon to everyone. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank the PID, uh, P PIDS for the invitation to uh, be a reactor in this, uh, in this talk. Uh, okay, just gonna give me a moment. I'll share my screen. Okay. Okay. Again, a uh, pleasant good afternoon to everyone, uh, especially to uh, Dr. Albert. Uh, thank you for that very excellent presentation. Uh, I'm sure everyone has learned a lot. And uh, for uh, as part of this uh, talk. Uh, I would like to congratulate first uh, Dr. Albert's team on doing a lot of work in terms of the analysis of the NICTHS of 2019. Uh, I agree with your, uh, with your statement that uh, this was done in pre-pandemic, so a lot has already changed when it comes to uh, ICT uh, just in the past uh, two, one and a half years, two years, because of the COVID-19 pandemic. So uh, for this afternoon, I'll just give to you some insights and some key points that uh, key takeaways that were really struck struck me when in uh, in, what, uh, in uh, Dr. Albert's talk or Dr. Albert's uh, presentation. Well, uh, first of all, uh, some of the salient points that uh, we have seen as uh, presented was uh, the scarce ICT statistics that is available in uh, in the Philippines. I agree that uh, with Dr. Albert that. Uh, we cannot manage what we cannot uh, measure or what we do not measure. And the first and foremost, we have to measure really what, uh, what, where are we now in terms of ICT, uh, uh, in terms of ICT. So that means uh, understanding uh, the landscape of where we are 
right now. Uh, what are the different uh, statistics uh, or indicators that uh, needs to be monitored or needs to be measured? One surprising thing for me is that uh, women outdo men in terms of ICT use. I guess uh, that is something that uh, for me is uh, a result that is uh, quite sur surprising. And the affinity for online selling also is uh, is uh, less among uh, employed individuals. I think uh, this has uh, exacerbated in during the uh, pandemic because uh, now we have we see a lot we see more and more of online selling uh, on online transactions okay um, and also because of this lack of statistics we need to really uh, do a regular monitoring of this uh, of the state of ICT in the country especially now that uh, a lot has changed because of the COVID-19. The second key point that uh, I would like to highlight is that the digital divide remains a reality in the Philippine society and uh, of course, the reality is that we have greater internet use in urban areas as compared to rural ones. However, uh, a lot of Filipinos are still not connected to the internet. And uh, while we own a lot of cell, uh, a lot of Filipinos own cell phones, very few households have uh, computers. And the quality of connectivity is always a persistent issue. I, this is something that I've heard uh, time and time again that people are, uh, Filipinos are always looking for faster and faster connection. However, when we talk about geographically isolate, isolated and disenfranchised or uh, disadvantaged areas, uh, it's not a question of whether you have a fast connectivity or a slow, slow connectivity, but rather it's a, it's a question of whether you have any connectivity or not. So any connectivity, no matter how bad it is, is always better than no connection at all, especially in isolated or remote areas. Next is uh, the digital skills of the Fil of Filipinos really needs a lot of uh, significant improvement. Uh, as highlighted in the in the paper, we re most of the bulk of the use of the uh, uh, internet is really for social and leisure activities and access to information, and that that is something that is very much uh, very glaring. Even for the sites that we have uh, we've been to, it's always using internet connectivity for social applications, social media, and so on. There's very minimal use for learning, access to government services, and online transactions, especially in rural areas. And uh, this is something that has to be developed uh, together with the improvement of the infrastructure. It's not just about uh, providing the infrastructure, the ICT infrastructure in remote areas, but rather also providing uh, trainings, uh, education, adult, uh, education, uh, and so on, so that people will get to use or get to understand more how they can maximize the utilization of internet connectivity to improve their livelihood or in, in improve their standard of living. And as uh, expected, a lot of our young adults are very much internet savvy. And that's, uh, I think, uh, that's also, uh, that's very well known for most of all, almost all of us. Uh, for older uh, adults uh, and individuals with less schooling, they have low access to ICT, which is uh, true, but that doesn't mean they have to be left behind. Uh, we can always have programs in terms of uh, educating them on how they can use internet connectivity. Uh, digital infrastructure remains a huge challenge. We have uh, barang uh, uh, one third of the barangays only have access to cell towers. Uh, to less in terms of fiber, fiber, and even less for the free Wi-Fi program, and that the concept of digital divide occurs not only between uh, urban areas and rural areas, but also within urban areas itself. And uh, primarily, this is driven by because of the cost of equipment and the cost of subscription as a uh, main drivers or main reasons why people do not have internet access. And lastly, uh, the ICT policy framework, and we all know this, everyone who's working in the ICT uh, sector knows that we really need to reform our uh, policies. And so as what was said, we are living in a digital world using analog policies. Uh, some recent developments such as EO127 provided short-term relief, but it needs to be further strengthened to, through legislation. And uh, National programs would have a, should have a monitoring component, especially for the uh, free Wi-Fi program. Having coupling this, the the improvement of in infrastructure with digital literacy training and reskilling of the workforce, and again, doing the NICTHS every two to three years uh, needs to be done as well because it provides us with uh, with a constant uh, way to measure how much has changed and how much more 
needs to change. So with the state of uh, of the landscape right now, we can all, we all know that we needed the connectivity yesterday. We don't need it next month. We don't need it next year. We needed it yesterday, especially in light of the COVID-19 pandemic, wherein we, sh we sh suddenly shifted from online, uh, from face-to-face -face classes, for example, and face-to-face -face transactions to online everything, online classes, online transactions. So now we are at a stage that connectivity is not is no longer a luxury. It's already a necessity, much like electricity, water. Every connectivity now is a very much needed uh, necessities for Filipinos to be continue uh, to continue to learn, to continue to be uh, part of society, and uh, that poses a very big challenge here in our country. So the question is, how do we bridge the digital divide to promote inclusive development? And this is something that for me is very very fresh. Because uh, just earlier this week, I took this photo. Uh, this was in uh, Barangay Manurigao in Davao de Oro, in, or in Compost, uh, formerly the Compostela Valley Province. And this is actually about 1.2 kilometers above sea level. And uh, I, uh, this was, uh, we went there uh, as a barangay of about 1,000 uh, individuals. And it was really disconnected to the internet, to the point that we were disconnected from the rest of the world for three days. So imagine uh, how the challenge of living in such an environment, everything you, that you, you don't have any idea of, uh, of how, what is going on in the outside world. We can always talk about numbers, percentages, statistics, but it's a different reality. Uh, it's a different thing when you are living that reality of being disconnected from the rest of the Philippines and the rest of the world. And uh, one reason or one way we tried to address this in the past is uh, what uh, utilizing uh, technology that is already existing, primarily through the use of telecom satellites. We can't wait for months or years for telcos to lay down fiber, to lay down uh, cell sites or to build cell sites uh, in areas. And we all know that the main driver for that is the, uh, the economic activities. So if there is no economic activity, uh, you find it hard to uh, have cell sites or have uh, digital infrastructure. But then it's a catch-22 because uh, the, we can always look at having connectivity as a driver for change for economic activity, something that can really push a, a barangay or a community towards a greater economic development. And uh, the only way that we can access uh, or to bring, we can bring connectivity immediately is uh, through the use of what we call telecommunication satellites. And this having telecommunication satellites or having these kinds of links, you can think of it as uh, having a real, suddenly having a real road or having a road to a particular area. It doesn't matter what kind of car or vehicle traverses that road, uh, but then having that provides a lot of opportunity in education, in health, in social services, in e-commerce, and even in uh, in governance. So we find that that's a way that uh, satellites can provide as a means to connect isolated islands and barangays, not just uh, those that are close to urban areas or in, uh, or in rural areas, but also in those that are geographically isolated and disadvantaged. And we did we did this through uh, one uh, a pilot program for this is the Access Mindanao program. Uh, which we have started uh, ex almost exactly a year ago. We're in uh, this uh, Atene de Davao Community Connectivity Empowered by Satellite Services for Mindanao. So it's a research and advocacy program wherein we use satellites to connect uh, communities primarily through schools so that they can we can bridge the digital divide. And, and just this, in one year of operating uh, Access Mindanao, we have actually connected 14 different sites. Uh, our 14th site came online only just last weekend. That was the site in Dinaga. So each of these sites, all scattered all throughout uh, Mindanao, from the northernmost province to the easternmost province uh, to the southernmost province, all the way down to Tawi Tawi. Each of these sites are connected uh, using satellite internet or satellite connect, con uh, connectivity. And it's uh, something that it takes only a day of connectivity. So really, we don't need to, need to wait months or years. The technology exists and it's a matter of harnessing and utilizing these technologies. So just to show you, uh, we, we've connected uh, IP communities such as the Tiboli Sibusu High School, 
uh, in Lake Cebu, uh, even uh, Islamic communities uh, in uh, or madrasas or Islamic schools uh, in Tawi-Tawi, even in Basilan, which is not just an Islamic uh, school, but also fa uh, found in a conflict-ridden area. And even in uh, Datu Piang in Maguindanao, another uh, conflict-ridden area, and uh, even in another IT community. So these are just some examples that to show that really connect connection can re can really uh, using satellite connection can really bridge the digital divide in especially in these areas where connectivity rarely exists if not, barely, barely exists or probably none at all and we all we all of these technologies or all these sites can be monitored remotely so we don't need to be physically present so it's a matter of harnessing the current technologies that we have so that we can provide uh, the connection to uh, to these communities and bring them, uh, make them part of our society as part of a uh, inclusive development. And we have partnerships also with the DICT, wherein we bring in the connection, and then DICT also brings in the computer. So now uh, students, uh, teachers, and the community can actually utilize the computers so that they can uh, go online, do research. Hopefully not uh, just doing Facebook and so on, but uh, that is, I think that is something that would be unavoidable. But then this is where training and uh, reskilling would have to come in, uh, come together with the development of the infrastructure. So just to, uh, as a final slide, uh, we really need to improve the, not just the quality, uh, the quantity of the digital infrastructure, but also the quality. Uh, so that includes uh, regular assessments and monitoring. We need to address the lack of connectivity in more than 60% of barangays nationwide, especially in last mile areas. And you, we utilize technologies such as satellites to immediately bridge the digital divide. So here we, get, we, we have to look at it as connectivity as a catalyst for inclusive and sustainable socioeconomic development. By providing connectivity in isolated areas, this can really open up opportunities in education, in health, in social services, commerce, and, uh, even, and especially economic activities that can eventually sustain the kind of connectivity that they are uh, enjoying. Uh, integrating digital literacy programs in infrastructure development projects is also important. It's not just a matter of providing the infrastructure, but also training the people how they can utilize and harness uh, that connectivity so that they can improve their quality of life. We need to maximize the connectivity for teleeducation, telemedicine, uh, e-commerce, e-governance, and not just for leisure, for entertainment, not just for social media. Okay? And finally, uh, pushing for policy reforms so that we can open up the communication sector and strengthening the partnerships between government, academia, and industry so that everyone can actually enjoy the benefits provided by uh, having connectivity and no one gets left behind. So with that, uh, again, I would like to congratulate uh, the researchers led by uh, Dr. Albert for a very good analysis and very good paper. Uh, it's, it's, it was quite a read, but then uh, for, for those who haven't seen or read it, it's really worth reading and it can, uh, it, uh, we, you can realize a lot of things that needs to improve, uh, needs to improve in terms of uh, the state of internet connectivity here in our country. Thank you very much. And thank you very much to Dr. Sese. Um, we appreciate um, that you underscore the importance of a whole of society approach in your uh, recommendations, uh, the importance of, you know, um, strengthening government, industry, academic um, linkages in, in addressing um, um, our ICT issues. Okay, so moving on, um, the country's uh, digital uh, transformation needs the support of all industry players, both big and small. And one of those players is our cable, cable uh, internet operators. And in this regard, um, I invite all of you to listen to the comments of Mr. Jose Luis Dabao, the president of the Philippine Cable and Telecommunications Association. As one of his former uh, directors, he headed the communications and policy committees and re represented the association in discussing legislative and regulatory matters with the National Telecommunications Commission and the Congress to push forward measures that will help get more Filipinos connected to the internet. He was elected a president of the association in 2020 to direct digital transformation in the midst of the pandemic. 
Among the strategies initiated is shifting member workshops online for the massive infrastructure deployment required to support homeschooling and work from home requirements. Mr. Dabao, uh, the, the virtual floor is now yours. Hi, thank you. I can just share my screen. Excellent. I'd like to thank the Philippine Institute for Development Studies for inviting me to represent the Philippine Cable and Telecommunications Association. We are always happy to in be involved in conversations seeking to bridge the, the digital divide. As a cable operator myself, operating in a rural town, I see it with my own eyes and would very much like to do more. But first, let me take a few minutes to introduce the associations and some of our efforts to bridge the digital divide. So the PCTA is comprised of 303 regular PCTA members throughout Luzon, Visayas, and Mindanao, covering 79 cities and 222 municipalities. And one of the numbers very close to my heart is that 201 of our members are now, serve, are now providing internet service. I really wish it was 303, but it would take me more than 15 minutes to explain why that is not the case. Uh, to briefly describe the association, we, the Association of Cable TV Operators in the Philippines, stand united in the pursuit of a common vision, an industry run by professionals providing the highest standards of cable TV service to the Philippine public. We work together for this threefold mission, adequate protection and assistance of the members of the industry, active participation in national efforts towards progress and development, and commitment to the significant upliftment of the industry. Uh, in the light of the COVID pandemic, we had to deploy a whole lot of infrastructure and a lot of our members had to do things that they did not uh, know how to do. As such, the main activity we did throughout uh, 2020 was to have uh, webinars for the varying, um, for the varying disciplines. Um, the one in-person uh, workshop we had was prior to the lockdowns in March, but uh, for the, on the technical side, we did a lot on fiber to the home because that seems to be the uh, most practical way to deliver internet uh, in, in the countryside. And uh, uh, very importantly, if you look at the lower left, we talked a lot about uh, safety. Uh, come you know March, April, May, a lot of us didn't know what we were doing with regards to uh, safety in in light of uh, COVID nineteen. So there was a lot of improvised equipment uh, before we could eventually get properly supplied. Then the latest feather in our cap uh, for the in trying to connect as many people that we have uh, is the PCTA Internet Exchange Project. The PCTA Internet Exchange Project is a PCTA-backed, professionally managed internet exchange sitting in a TIM Carmona. The objective is to share local traffic to reduce latency and reduce costs, to integrate leverage and get better pricing from telco operators for local loop content and content delivery networks. This is a social enterprise to help smaller cable operators get into the internet. So hopefully, as more operators get connected, we currently have around 10 operators doing about 9 gigabytes of traffic. Uh, it's far from where we'd like it to be, but it's certainly an improvement. And hopefully, as more of our members connect, uh, we we're able to bring more homes online. So the work that IDS has done in analyzing this, the study is phenomenal. And we agree with what we've heard. Um, we would like to echo that more sustainable development goals should have been captured. We don't believe in connectivity for connectivity's sake, but connectivity for purpose. Knowing the demand side would help direct policy and investment. Is the trend more towards phones with laptops being unable to catch up? Are wearables taking off? If so, maybe wireless should be the focus. Is the trend towards more powerful computing? If that's the case, then perhaps we should be focusing on wired. And tracking the supply side in detail would give clear answers to what is lacking in filling the demand side and would steer inquiry as to why that particular type of connectivity is lagging if there is demand for it. Now, I wouldn't be a very good rep of PCTA if I didn't say the NICTHS would be improved if it captured cable TV and internet. What could have happened if it captured cable of internet? In, uh, in an industry, industry survey we have done in 2020, uh, we showed that uh, there are over 5 million homes connected to cable TV. And that same survey estimated the cable internet subscribers at a little over 2 million. 
the impact on the survey would have shown an increase in available fiber for Parangay from less than 30%. So most, since most cable operators use either fiber to the neighborhood or fiber to the home. And you would have likely seen an increase in, like, in ISPs available as well, since most subscribers don't call cable companies ISPs. Finally, with 91% of homes a TV, uh, sorry, finally, 91% of homes have a TV and 40% of those receive an analog TV signal. The 51% of the valence are connected to something, and we believe a significant number of that is cable. We support the ways forward, especially the updating of policy. Open access and data transmission will be very helpful, especially in the other segments, uh, especially the middle mile, and with infrastructure sharing. Spectrum management reform, uh, the old law definitely needs to be more dynamic. New technology is coming up that allows for spectrum to be used only in certain areas. We don't need to look at uh, we don't need to look at it now from a nationwide point of view anymore. We would include two laws: uh, the, the cable TV and DTH development act, and the rural wired connectivity act. These are two new laws just filed in the Senate. Uh, one would strengthen the uh, CATV industry and uh, what, what is estimated to be one thousand of them providing both cable TV and internet. And the Rural Wired Connectivity Act would help to uh, incentivize uh, de deployment in rural areas. We also think it would be very helpful if there is a fast track on the DICT, RTAD, JMC on fiber buildouts, formation of the oversight committee since the, since the JMC came out already. Recently, NEA increased pole rentals up to 400% in some areas. While the cost may not be a policy concern, a uniform price, whether it being a first-class city or a sixth-class municipality, will definitely affect where investments in infra will go. And this is something the, uh, the Oversight Committee can do something about. Because without intervention, it becomes more expensive to connect the unconnected and will only slow down the efforts to bridge the divide. I'll end by, say, by uh, positing my answer to the question. How do we bridge the, di the digital divide? And I say, my answer is, let's not restrict those who are willing and able from contributing to solving the problem. And with that, I would like to end my short presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Dabao, for your insightful comments. Okay. So friends, moving on, our uh, last discussion has tirelessly advocated for ICT rights, governance, uh, development and security to uh, through the democracy.net.ph, a group that he co-founded and co-convened. His efforts contributed to the, to the enactment of several ICT reform initiatives such as the DICT Act, the Free Internet in Public Places Act, and the Mobile Number Portability Act. He was also involved in the development of significant DICT and NCC memorandum circulars. So I am talking about Engineer Pair Tito Gala, Engineer Gala, has also proposed several legislative initiatives to Congress, including the Spectrum Management Act, the Rural, Rural Wire Development Act, the Open Access and Data Transmission Act, and the Magna Carta for Philippine Internet Freedom. Engineer Gala, Gala the virtual floor is now yours. Hi, uh, thank you very much. Uh, first, I'd like to congratulate the Philippine Institute for Development Studies for this very informative webinar, and uh, Dr. Albert for the very comprehensive National ICT Household Survey. Our belief in democracy.net.ph as far as this topic is concerned is that the primary role of government is to establish a policy environment that promotes 21st, in, 21st century information and communications technology, right? Um, ICT arguably uh, was developed in the late 19th century with, tel with the telegraph and uh, wirelessly in the early 20th century with wireless telegraphy. But we are way, way behind when it comes to uh, po government policies, laws, and regulations to the point where we are not promoting 21st century ICT. The secondary role of government is in case of market failure, abuse of market dominance, and similar issues found in the private sector, that's when the government should intervene. 
not before, right? Uh, there are a lot of people who want to put the cart before the horse, but no, intervention must only arrive in case of market failure or abuse of market dominance. Not before, government should not be the starter. Competition still is king in, uh, in terms of 21st century ICT because it is anchored on uh, redundancy. Rel uh, it has to be uh, distributed, decentralized, and redundant for uh, ICT to be reliable, uh, efficient, and uh, well, essentially good for our use. The tertiary role of government now, in case these two these two preceding roles are are already satisfied or sufficient, there has to be limited and precision targeted investment prioritizing the marginalized and dis disadvantaged. In other words, we should not be spending in the cities. We should be spending in places where Dr. Sese already mentioned that Access Mindanao has already been going. If there is a failure of the private sector to go to this location. That's the only time the government should step in. And um, more importantly, it is good that Dr. Albert emphasized in slide 41 that digital infrastructure has many technologies, not just mobile. So as correctly pointed out by Dr. Sese, uh, we can implement uh, sa satellite technologies for geographically isolated and disadvantaged areas, but also if there are utility poles there, then we can bring in the cable TV industry as, uh, as promoted by, uh, by Mr. Dabao, the PCTA. So having said that, to establish a policy environment that promotes 21st century ICT, I joined this webinar in saying that we need the Open Access in Data Transmission Act for coherent governance of data transmission infrastructure. We, we need that. We need to bring our our basic fundamentals to the 21st century. We need a Spectrum Management Act for similarly coherent governance of spectrum patrimony. Uh, Mr. Dabao is correct. Uh, we, are, we don't need to look at spectrum as a national resource. In fact, we should implement things like dynamic spectrum allocation where uh, spectrum may be assigned only to as large as, let's say, a municipality or a province so that uh, we can have smaller telcos if that's what we that's what we want that can operate only in certain regions if that's what we want we need to have this kind of flexibility for the 21st century we also join this call to pro to pass the better internet act which will provide minimum quality of service standards and metrics for internet connectivity services not just speed because speed is nothing if your connection is not reliable we need metrics like apart from download speed and upload speed we also need metrics like latency, packet loss, jitter, uptime, and reliability. Uh, the ISPs rarely tell us this, and this is something that we need to understand so that we will, uh, we will be able to get value for money. We will be able to uh, pay, pay exactly what we deserve uh, in, in terms of internet connectivity services. But also, uh, apart from these three, these three fundamentals, we also need, apart from the Rural Wire Development Act, which is intended to increase penetration in rural areas by converting costs to connect to, to new rural subscribers to tax credits, thereby providing ISPs the opportunity to spend more for infrastructure expansions and upgrades. So because it, uh, it, it turns the cost to connect in the rural areas, not urban areas, in the rural areas to tax credits, it will, it will spur a flywheel effect in, in connecting the rural areas with wired connectivity. Then there's all, there's, there was mentioned EO127, but we need something bigger. The Satellite-Based Technologies for Internet Connectivity Act. It opens up the ubiquitous availability of satellite technologies for internet connectivity, which will be useful for GIDA areas, which is 21% of the country, or roughly 6.7 million people that do not have, that may not have existing wired connectivity services. Remember, we are 7,641 7, islands with approximately 2,000 being long-term populated. And not all of these islands have uh, the ability to be connected by wired. Then uh, apart from legislation, we need to have a whole of, gov whole of nation approach. So it was mentioned earlier by, uh, Mr. Dabao about ARTA, 
but we need to have something bigger like a shared passive ICT infrastructure policy, which will govern all shared utility poles. So we will no longer have exclusive this, exclusive that when it comes to poles, and there will be there will be no such thing as unfair unfair pole rental pricing. And this is an issue for the NEA to spearhead. But apart from that, there also should be a shared underground utility corridors, tunnels, and culverts policy. So that, uh, as you know, every typhoon, uh, utility poles fall down, fall down. We need to have more resilient uh, infrastructure like shared utility corridors, tunnels, and culverts, which the DPWH should spearhead. Now, I personally, I'm looking forward to the next in, uh, national uh, ICT household survey and the granular data that will, that will provide so that we will watch the measurable growth of the Philippine ICT ecosystem. But as a final note to the survey, the governance of the Philippine ICT ecosystem should be anchored on rights, governance, development, and security. So our hope is that we also take a look at how well we are anchored. ICT is an ecosystem. It's not just about technology. It's also about the users and the way we use it. And a final note on this webinar, Dr. Albert is correct. These issues of ICT, which affect us daily, not just the front end, but not just the front end that uh, the, our phones and devices, but in the back end, which is our macroeconomics, the amount of money that our country earns. These issues of Philippine ICT should be campaign issues. And we should demand from our candidates for national and local office with what their ICT platforms are and what their ICT proposed action plans are. Even more urgently, we need ICT champions in national and local posts, national and local posts, because what you do in the local government affects uh, your ICT use in your community. And we need them in the legislative, in national and local legislative posts, in the national local and local executive posts, in the national and local judiciary posts, and constitutional commissions like the civil service, so that everyone is empowered through the use of ICT. Thanks again. Thanks for having me. And thank you very much, uh, Engineer Galia. The, your final, uh, your last two minutes of your uh, uh, comments are really very insightful in the light of our forthcoming uh, elections. Maraming salamat, sir, for emphasizing that, that we, we, we need to have ICT champions in, in, in government and we need, um, you know, when we select um, our future leaders, we need to take that in serious consideration. Okay, before we proceed, uh, friends, to the open forum, um, allow me to um, uh, let us listen to our um, uh, presenter um, for, for some uh, brief uh, response to the comments of our uh, discussions. You may have uh, something to, uh, to say in, re in response to uh, what our discussions mentioned. Um, Dr. Albert will be aided by uh, um, Ms. Grace Mirandilla Santos, who served as consultant for this study. And I think Dr. Okay. Uh, okay. Only um, Ms. Uh, Santos is um, in our uh, webinar today. Uh, so let me start with uh, Mr. With uh, Ms. Santos, Ms. Grace. Would you have anything to say in response to the comments? Particularly uh, those that are uh, related to your part of the your part in the study, ma'am. Yes. Uh, good afternoon. Thank you, uh, Ms. Sheila. And um, of course, as always, a very lively and passionate delivery by Sir Toots. I don't talaga si Sir. Um, my comment would be that um, the survey was done in 2018 to 2019. So with that caveat, we have to take into consideration that many things have happened in terms of, uh, well, the pandemic, of course, happened and everything changed since then. So we have to take into consideration that even um, the, the survey's results have also, might have also drastically changed. And as we are getting more information from the ground, from people 
um, like uh, Dr. Uh, Romar um, and uh, Sir Joel Dabao, who are of course very uh, directly involved in network rollout. Um, we we do know that there have been um, a lot of um, deployment happening, uh, um, and also as the bottlenecks that were that were brought about by the pandemic eased not only in terms of mobility restrictions but in terms of purchasing equipment from abroad um you know things that are happening at the, the in the background that we are not aware of all of these things have all contributed to um improving some of the things that um were very difficult to do pre pre pandemic and during the pandemic um secondly uh we as as a co-author we we did propose in our report uh, you know, um, ways to improve the next survey. And I do hope, and um, I, I think I can say this on behalf of the, you know, the ICT civil society community that we do hope that this is not the last survey of its, uh, you know, it, it's the first of its kind. And it was a very ambitious survey. Um, and of course, like anything that you do for the first time, there will be um, a lot of difficulties and, you know, the learning curve would be very high. But we do hope that the, our proposal for on how to improve the survey would be um, taken up by the DICT for its succeeding surveys. Um, first, first of first of I, I would say first on my list would be being accommodating of the different types of internet service providers on the ground, uh, because this is one of the things that I personally have advocated. No. Um, when we talk about internet, it's not just the telcos. Internet is not synonymous to telecommunications. Um, so many technologies and different types of networks can be used to offer internet. In other countries, it's actually the cable TV operators that dominate the internet or the broadband market. In other countries, um, um, in some countries, especially in the Pacific Islands, it's satellite technology. Um, so telecommunications just happen to be the predominant um, technology in, in the country. So the, the survey needs to be more open um, to, you know, to these different options. Because um, if the objective is to um, inform policy making, mm -hmm. inform legislators and uh, decision makers on how to expand connectivity, then we have to, to make sure that we're mm -hmm. getting uh, data not based on the, the limitations of the current situation and not based on the legal restrictions that are that we are suffering from because of outdated laws but we have to make sure that we are actually helping decision makers explore mm -hmm. the different viable options so I'm, I'm very happy that we actually have here um you know uh people who are actually promoting emerging technologies and different types of service providers so that, that's that's uh, my initial comment. So I, uh, Sir Toots, please go ahead. Yeah, uh, thanks, Grace. As always, uh, it's uh, I'm, I'm glad you're you're on board in the team because you, you give you give a, a particular side to 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 what what we wanted to say, which is that um, first and foremost, you know, technology is changing so fast. But unfortunately, you know, the even the, the survey when I think that that's why we were we were a bit surprised. There were many limitations, but for whatever limitations there are, at least it, it was a start, you know. And I, I agree with um, with Mr. Dabao that it would have been nice if there would there had been also other questions related to, to cable itself because I I mean I would like to have cable internet but even in my own in my own uh, condominium here in Makati, uh, they, you know, when when there was a pre-selling years ago, and I, I bought into it, it seemed like the the developer already tied the, the 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 condominium with one telco, you know. So there's no way to for me to get cable TV, even if I wanted to. I like because I know cable TV will. Will will cable internet will be much faster, but you know, unfortunately, because of all of that, whatever it is, they 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 you know, it's even in our, my contract in in, in 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 for for this uh for this uh, condominium. So so sometimes occasionally I have uh, internet problems, partly because you know uh, of technology. In the same way, 
I'm a bit worried, you know, when it comes to the DICT. At least it's, it started off with the with the survey. It was it it seemed to be too focused on 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 the current technologies, not, not quite recognizing that there are, as Grace was pointing out, you know, uh, there there are so many technologies around, you know, and unfortunately, maybe in a way, at least, uh, it, it gives us a starting point. But there are so many things that that we need to address, and I, I'm glad also to some extent that you know we had a very good set of panelists who are giving their 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 their, their perspectives, uh, you know, because ICT is something that's very dramatic. It, uh, by by dramatic, I mean fast changing. Fast changing. And 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 because of that, uh, you know, our laws, especially, I'm just surprised. Even our campaigns, you know, are. Only one so far of our presidential candidates has talked about ICT. No one else, you know. And uh, I mean, the, maybe the mayor of Manila, he, maybe he has he he sees the the problems uh, even within Manila. But then I'm surprised there are so many candidates. How many? Um, uh, practically a hundred candidates, presidential candidates for one position, and yet na, none of them has has come out except one, you know, to talk about ICT. And that's a, it's a, it's it's sad, you know, because right now we should not be even looking for who will substitute for what, you know, for the campaign. That's that's a ridiculous. Again, it's so personality driven. We should be talking about development issues. We should be talking about what will be good for this country. But unfortunately, we seem to be so fixated about people, about certain people becoming president, rather than actually, you know, solving problems, especially when it comes to our outdated laws some of which you know are putting all of these regulatory barriers so that we can have country ecosystem there are some improvements but we're we seem to be it's it's usually these policies that are that are so outdated and i mean i'm glad to some extent the ict is trying its best to do some work but even the ICT has a, a lot of problems no? uh, as it moves forward in trying to promote ICT because right now everything is always being put to, to the ICT uh, and some I think might be too much. They're, they're maybe trying to do too much in too little time <laughs> uh, given with too little resources. Thank you very much, Toots. Um, we, we have uh, some uh, participants from the DICT and for sure they have heard uh, the concerns and as well as the suggestions. And there are also some questions in the chat box that are uh, directed to them and we would uh, greatly appreciate uh, their response later during the open forum. So at this point, uh, before uh, we go to the open uh, forum. Uh, let's I uh, have a short break uh, and uh, in order for our presenters to have uh, some time to rest. So let us have a short break by running a poll. Okay, so at this point, uh, you are all invited, especially our WebEx participants to participate in this poll. So and from among those who answered it correctly, we will pick three names who will each get a PIDS notebook. So are you ready? Okay, so here is the question. Uh, and uh, I got uh, this question from uh, the presentation of Dr. Albert. Okay, so here's the question. BARM has the poorest access to a telecom tower, fiber optic cable, and free Wi-Fi. Name two other regions with the poorest access to a telecom tower. Is it A, uh, Eastern Visayas and Bicol, B, Nimarope and Cagayan Valley, OC, um, CAR, and Nimaropa. Okay, so you have 10 seconds to uh, key in your, uh, to, to select your answer. Is it A, B, or C? Okay, just 10 seconds. Gwen, just tell us yeah, if... Will, uh, yes, I'll close the poll now. Okay, thank you very much. And I think um, WebEx needs a bit uh, like... 10 more seconds. Uh, to 10 process. more seconds to process um the answers okay do we have the answer now uh the outcome okay. the results now okay here okay so what is the answer it is a definitely this a is eastern visayas and uh b call so 21 uh participants uh in webex got it right so from um 
those 21 participants, as I've said, we will uh, pick uh, three names who will each get a PIDS notebook. Okay, so congratulations in advance. I will um, announce the winners before uh, we end the webinar. Okay, so at this point, I now um, invite our uh, all our speakers, uh, Dr. Albert, uh, Dr. Uh, Sesa, Mr. Dabao, Engineer Gala, as well as uh, Ms. Mary Grace Mirandilio uh, to join the panel. And uh, I have, um, let me check our chat box, okay, for the questions. Perhaps we can uh, start with um, with a question of, uh, okay, I saw a question here from Dr. William Padulina. And this is uh, for you, Dr. Albert. Have we had a chance to correlate access to ICT with the poor reading scores in PISA and with SEAP uh, uh, LM? S-E-A-P-L-M? Um, yeah, uh, yeah, unfortunately, uh, you know, you can't really correlate because they're not the, the same, you know, there's no way for us to, 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 to put these two together. But what, we, what, what, what should be quite obvious is that there are digital gaps. No? And where are mm -hmm. the gaps? It's always within urban and rural, uh, across regions. And we also know that with the, the regions that are doing well are the uh, and the urban areas are the are the areas where where supposedly literacy is better. <laughs> so mm -hmm. that's why you might be able to think that maybe reading is somewhat related to uh, to ICT or and or the lack of reading skills is somewhat also related to the poor digital skills that we actually have. Uh, but there, you know, it's just like uh, an indirect co uh, co 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 uh, correlation. Uh, nonetheless, and the, this is also one of the reasons why we were asked, we were hoping that in the future, the ICT also put in assets data that should be collected so that way we will be able to really definitively see whether it's there is a gap between the poor and the non-poor. Because it's, again, the, the usual case where the, uh, by and large, we, we know that digital skills, well, well lots of skills are, are, are needed for us. But we know that the poor uh, always are at the losing end when it comes to um, when it comes to education and literacy. The quality of education, the quality of of of, of learning that's being uh, 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 received by the poor, especially now during the pandemic, when they're you know we already know that many of them don't even have very good access to the net. So there, uh, I I remember you know when this when the pandemic started. I had discussions with the Department of Education officials. They were thinking of going digital, you know, digi fully, fully digitally le digital learning. And I said, "Wait a minute! Our our results from the DICT na, na household survey suggest very few households, especially I would think among the poor, would would probably have access uh, to the internet. So, and this is the reason why eventually the, the 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 Department of Education opted for blended learning. However, I'm I'm hoping that you know we have to start getting out and make our kids go back to school because it's not good for them to you know we're the only country in the world that continues to have our our kids stay at home. And you know I would really think that this will have a lot of repercussions. In the, in, in, when they start joining the labor market, you know, many of our kids are just stuck at home and they're not, they're not really learning the, you know, when you learn, you also have to play, you know, you have to have social interaction and that's what's missing now. And I'm afraid because of that, we already have had very bad scores in PISA. I'm sure if we're actually going to have, uh, participate in the next PISA, we're even going to be, be even lower now unless we start really investing in People, people, people. Okay, thank you very much, Toots. Let's proceed to the question of, um, okay. Okay, from Mr. Merwin Salazar of uh, the Senate Economic Planning Office. Um, and this uh, is related to uh, one of the findings of the survey, which shows that majority of the respondents are using internet or for social activities and only few are using internet for learning or accessing um, information and in government websites or uh, for services and other and other productive um, activities. 
uh, how do we influence the behavior of Filipino households in their internet usage towards productive activities? Okay, um, would you like to um, comment on this? Um, yeah, maybe I'll, I'll, you have I'll some thoughts. A few, uh, a few, a few thoughts. Uh, yes, Sheila. yes. Um, briefly, and then I, I saw um, uh, Engineer Gala raising his hand. Go ahead, Toots, and then we yeah, can go okay. to Engineer just, Gala. Just let's recognize because I've also been doing. Let's recognize that capacity building is, is really the key here. And when you're thinking of capacity building, it's not it's going to be a process. It's not going to be something that overnight people will learn how to use ICT. I say this because even, you know, the past few days, I've been bogged with media interviews uh, after I did a, an Ateneo lecture on how to use surveys. And still, when it comes to statistical literacy, it's so disappointing despite the fact that you keep explaining, you know, certain things. In, 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 in ways that people can understand. Yet, when you start looking at the Facebook reactions of, 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 of people, you see that there are a lot of cognitive biases. People will just listen to what they want to listen, listen to. They focus on a few words. And that's the problem when you, when you have also attempts to, to, to make people more literate. Because at the end of the day, there are, there are a lot of cognitive biases. Second is people are also afraid of technology. I remember my mom when she was alive, she wouldn't like to even use the the you know uh, you know put on the, the television. <laughs> she she would stay at home for hours, but she would not even she wants to watch TV, but she wouldn't even use the the remote control because she says it's too hard. <laughs> you know, just to push the you know button. But that's the way things are. People are people who and and this is why we are calling for also some behavioral studies. To, to help people and to for us to understand get better insights on what works and what doesn't thank you uh dr albert uh now we go to you uh engineer gala so how can we um encourage more filipinos to capitalize on ict tools for productive purposes we're not saying that socialization <laughs> social media and communication are not productive activities but we're talking of you know generating income from it you know using ict for entrepreneurship using it for learning you know um getting more skills from um training uh online training that's becoming increasingly available online engineer <laughs> that's that's a valuable point right there that's a valuable point right there um, when you say productive activities, what do you mean by productive activities? The use of social media is productive, especially when you want to communicate with loved ones, right? Uh, there was an unofficial study that we stumbled into that the internet saved a lot of OFW marriages. Do not tell me that it's not productive. <laughs> but having said that, right, the reason why, uh, one of the ways to encourage ICT use towards entrepreneurship uh, towards economic uh, economic activity and things like that is number one you reduce the cost for all of us right uh, right now the reason why uh, social media is uh, very popular is because in the beginning it was free so you can't beat free and I would rather go to social media instead of having to spend on uh, having to spend just to just to connect that being said the pandemic showed us that uh ict is something that we will depend on for the rest of our lives we it is it's a it's a reality that 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 we're, we have to face and so and this is something that we're going to have to push people like sir joel of pcta to reduce the costs of, of our subscription to reduce the costs of being able to go to the internet so that we can use it for whatever we want once costs go down the kind of use will will widen up and that's that's the way it will be for us consumers on the side of the public sector and government we have to uh, we have to promote not necessarily depend on but promote a digital first policy one of the reasons why we don't go to government websites is because the information we want is not there or the services that we want is, is, is not there in other countries if i want to uh, renew my my license whether it's my my uh, my professional license or my driver's license, my first thing to do is I go to the website instead of going to the DM, DMV office. Oh, I'm sorry, the uh, LTO office. You always go to the website. 
uh, to be able to access services first. And that's going to encourage the use of the internet for uh, more productive activities. Thanks. More productive. Thank you. Thank you, engineer. Okay, but uh, how do we compare with other countries? Uh, yes, Grace, you know, in terms of, you know, e-entrepreneurship, use of ICT for, you know, we have qualified what productive is. How do we compare with other countries? Or is this something, you know, unique to Filipinos that we are so much into social media or com use of ICT for communications? Um, yes. Yes, Grace? Yes, uh, Ms. Sheila. Uh, first of all, uh, we 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 share the uh, the uh, the title of being one of the um, social, social media savvy, media savvy uh, <laughs> uh, countries now with with other developing countries. Um, I don't know if that's a, a badge of honor, but um, I, I think one of the one of the reasons now for this would be that uh, the Philippines is a mobile phone country, and mm -hmm. mobile phones, while they are you know smartphones. Um, it has its limitations. The number or percentage of households that have a computer is still very low. So um, if you want to get into e-commerce, for example, or transact online, it's, it's, uh, you know, it's difficult to do it on your smartphone. Mm -hmm. If you want to engage in online learning, although I would like to commend um, you know, entities such as schools that try to um, design their platforms for on uh, for mobile phones, you know, because of the recognition that 95%, um, if not 98%, of Filipinos actually. Uh, well, this is another uh, survey that I'm that I'm um, citing, but there is another survey that says 98% of Filipinos um, actually access the internet through mobile phones. So there are limitations to that. Um, secondly, and I think you and I think you uh, um, underscored in your policy note that you know while Filipinos' uh, top means of con connecting to the internet are the cellular and mobile phones, this may be a matter of availability than, than choice. choice. Yeah, rather that's than correct. choice. No. Yes, that that's correct. Um, that's actually my second point, uh, Ms. Sheila. Um, if if uh, the the only option or the only available connectivity is mobile cellular. Then then that will be a problem because um, as the survey the NICT um, uh, HS survey showed, um, many rural areas, many um, areas outside of the urban centers in the NCR are still on 3G. Um, while technically speaking, and the engineer pair can 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 attest to this, 3G technology can actually um, accommodate you know high bandwidth, but the content the contention ratio, <laughs> sorry, the contention ratio is the number of users or subscribers using or sharing bandwidth that's available in a cellular tower. If the contention ratio is super high, and I saw this also in the chat box, so when so many of us subscribers are trying to you know. Para tayong nagano eh, it's it's like a contest, no? Paunahan tayo sino yung makakagamit ng bandwidth sa cellular tower. Then mm. you know the you know 3G, as we define it in the Philippines, is very very slow. So that is also the second uh, problem. Mm. How can you trust doing online transactions if your um, internet is very slow? So yeah. you know, those are the two points that I'd like to highlight. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Ms. Grace. Okay, Dr. Sese, I, I saw you raising your hand. Go ahead, sir. Yes, uh, thank you, Sheila. I think uh, with regards to uh, how the internet is being used, uh, in a way, using it for social media is unavoidable. It's something that we have observed in, all, in almost all of our sites in Access Mindanao, that the first use is really to connect to Facebook to connect to Messenger, watch YouTube, and things like that. Uh, mainly because, siguro, it, it, it's probably because of the the deprivation of that connection. Kaya people are really raring to go to connect to their uh, to their relatives, to their loved ones, and that is that is part of human nature. But with over time, what we have observed is that at the start at the start of the of the uh, having, uh, for example, we connect one side. At the start, it's really very high utilization. But after a couple of months, 
the utilization actually stabilizes more or more or less and this is where we see not now it's being used in the in the manner that it was intended for because we installed it in schools uh, and one of the key factors is, that we realize is that it's not just about putting in that or bringing in the technology to a remote location, but also preparing the community. Uh, doing the social preparation really gave us a lot of uh, benefits uh, we, because it sets the expectations on what is this technology for, what is its mm -hmm. intended use, how uh, are you going to utilize it? And in a way, it also gives the community a sense of ownership that this is their, this is theirs to own. This is something they know that if this, if they don't utilize this well, this will not, this will not be sustainable. This will not, this will uh, eventually end. So they, it, it now gives them the sort of like motiv motivation so to really use it on what it's, uh, it is intended for. So as I said, uh, after a couple of months, the utilization is, has eventually stabilized. Of course, we still see every now and then social media. Right. In some cases, we mm -hmm. even see Netflix. Probably there's a new movie out in Netflix <laughs> uh, because we monitor the utilization as well. Right. But then uh, it's part of human nature and uh, doing the social preparation, uh, preparing the communities as part of uh, uh, digital literacy or digital literacy education right. can really br influence the mm -hmm. behavior of how the connectivity is being utilized. And uh, I think that is one of the key, uh, key learnings, key learnings that we had in the process with the different sites uh, uh, in, in Mindanao. Okay. I, I think all of us are excited to, um, uh, you know, to see the next, um, the subsequent uh, uh, NICT, um, National ICT Household Survey, the follow up to this, to, to see if there is a change, you know, um, in, in, in the um, ICT uh, utilization. We are all looking forward to that. So, yeah, let's see. Let's uh, look, uh, let's all look forward to that empirical evidence uh, in the subsequent uh, survey. I saw. Uh, Okay, I saw Mr. Dabao uh, raising his hand, sir. I just wanted to uh, support insights, everyone's please. point uh, that I, I think we're going to see a natural progression to the more uh, productive side of the internet, let's call it That's that. Because right. um, one of the benefits of being a laggard uh, with, with regards to adoption is we're also uh, that if you're a laggard, that means you're going to have the most growth when it does happen. And uh, I think we saw in a Google report, as um, uh, alluded to earlier by Dr. Albert, that we saw something like uh, $400 billion worth of deal flow into the Philippines for e-commerce. Mm -hmm. So with that kind of money coming into the country, it's in the interest of these companies to train people up to how to use their platforms. No? Okay. So yung mga, you know, people who say, I am not techie, I can't use that. These companies are going to spend money to educate these people and uh, help them to get and use these platforms. Like I, I fully expect uh, more and more people to be doing online selling and even investing uh, as the time, as uh, the years go by. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And and for sure with the transition to, you know, use of ICT tools during the pandemic, for sure merong pagbabago yan eh. Um, yes. Okay, so moving on, uh, let's uh, go to other questions. And Dr. Sese, uh, this one is for you. This is from Bien Ganapin. The issuance, let me read the question. The issuance of EO127 and its IRR provides an opportunity to expand internet access in areas not reached by telecommunication signals. From your presentation, there is already first and evidence that this is feasible. What are the likely challenges you see that may hinder the maximization of the use of satellites? As an additional comment on the legislative agenda, passing the bill amending the Public Service Act is also important to attract investments in telecommunications. Indeed, uh, Mr. Ganapin, yeah, the, um, um, the amendment of the Public Service Act will really help, you know, to attract uh, foreign investments in the telecom sector. Dr. Sese, sir, your answer, please. Yes. 
Uh, thank you for that question. Yes, uh, I, I think with, with EO127 and uh, the recently uh, released IRR, it in a way opens up the environment for the use of satellite technology, but uh, by 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 some some scale, some uh, some length or some scale, but not yet to the full extent that we really want to. Have. I, I think Grace would know this very well, and uh, she can comment uh, on that as well probably later. But uh, in terms of the challenges that would hinder the maximization of uh, utility, uh, satellites, uh, as of now, of course, when we compare the cost of satellite technology using satellite technology with uh, ground-based uh, infrastructure, the, the cost is really uh, is, is is very noticeable, uh, and this is where um, opening up the sector towards uh, having more players, uh, allowing value add uh, VASP uh, or value added uh, services or, or ISPs to really uh, to directly connect in in the absence of uh, or without the need for congressional franchise can really help open up the market. So it's. Uh, which eventually in time, the hope is it's really going to make uh, the technology in a way much more accessible uh, to a greater slice or a greater number of uh, people. So it's more, and then uh, there's also the challenge of the acceptance on the utilization of satellite technology because uh, we, it's, it's satellite technology is not something new. It's something that's ever since uh, the very first use of uh, space technology in the 1960s. It's been used for communications. And there have been numerous projects in the past that have used uh, satellite connectivity. However, the, there were very, uh, how should I say, uh, there were a lot of disappointments also that happened in the past in terms of the utilization. And this is what the reason why people now uh, are somewhat hesitant uh, in terms of using uh, satellite technology in, in areas that uh, were where it has been implemented before. But uh, we have to realize also that the technology has changed a lot in the past one, two decades. Uh, because in the past, we mainly use satellites for communications, uh, for voice, uh, so a little bit of uh, uh, messaging, but now the technology has significantly advanced that we can already use broadband inter uh, satellites for broadband internet. And it's uh, making people realize, and not just the, the, the users, but even our policymakers, our, our government agencies uh, realize that the technology has already evolved a lot and uh, it's uh, there and it, it's continually evolving over time as well. And it's... Uh, Avoiding the use of satellite technology can can really can uh, can can create how should I say it's not really a problem but it really would have disenfranchised a significant sector of society because that's the only way that you can connect them. I think Grace would or, or can comment also more on the on the implications of EO one two seven and uh, and uh, recently I uh, released IRR. We've had the discussions on this as well. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Grace, please. And then Mr. Dabao. I saw Mr. Dabao also raise his hand. And okay, engineer there. Okay, Grace? Yes, uh, thanks, Michila. Uh, yeah, I, I agree with the points of Doc uh, Romar. Um, in terms of the impact of EO127, um, the policy replaced an old satellite policy, which was focused on telecommunication, the traditional voice um, communication services. So that, that's what Doc uh, Romer said. Um, but what the new policy uh, promotes is a the um, promoting a diversity in terms of local players that can access satellite technology directly. So if you are an ISP or a, a value added service provider that would like to um, have internet connection via satellite, you no longer need to do this via a telco. Because in the past, you needed a middleman. Yeah. Sorry for the term, but that's really what they are. I mean, if the telcos don't have satellite technology, um, you know, they're not using satellite technology, but it's only because of their franchise that they're needed, then they're essentially a, a middle person. So now you can access satellite directly. But what it doesn't address, however, is the foreign ownership. So um, I think uh, Mr. Bien Ganapin might be... Uh, referring to you know the different business models that international satellite operators are using mm -hmm. um, there are satellite operators that would be happy to 
sell um, to the end users via a local partner, either a telco or an ISP. But there are also satellite operators that would rather sell directly to end users. Um, and if you are an international satellite operator and you are uh, a foreign owned company, then the interpretation is that you're not allowed to enter the market and sell directly to end users. So that's, I think that's why Mr. Uh, Ganapin mentioned. Mentioned the public service. Yes, the public app, service. Yes, app, which might yes. be helpful for satellite operators or any foreign telco yes. for that matter to enter the market and um, directly sell to uh, Filipino consumers. So um, as Dr. Romer said earlier, um, um, you know, EO127 is very helpful in that, uh, in that aspect that at least now um, you can uh, you, you can actually have more local players um, mm -hmm. benefiting from satellite if they choose to do so, if they find it um, appropriate for their community. Um, mm -hmm. And related to that, I would, uh, you know, go ahead and say that we have to promote these emerging technologies, no? Because mm -hmm. even testing emerging tech is very hard in the Philippines. Eh? <laughs> there are so many technologies out there. Uh, just recently, I was talking to someone who's offering laser technology you no know, for broadband so imagine that no parang tas ikakahon natin na nasaan ba yung laser sa RA7925 diba oh, yeah, parang, it's, right. it has become so frustrating that we are still in this analog era ano law and it is um this this restrictive environment is you know is really affecting how 110 Filipinos access the internet or do not access it Sorry, na nadala na ako. No? Yeah, no, very well said. Tama, tama. Natumbok mo, ano, Grace. Okay. Um, sir, Mr. Dabao, sir, yes, go ahead. Yeah, um, any, any conversation about satellite, uh, whatever the use is, you really have to bring spectrum management into, into the conversation. No? Because at the end of the day, that's the lifeblood of anything satellite. And we need to have uh, policies that will keep the satellite uh, spectrums, um, let, let's say, reserved no, for satellite technology. Because uh, very basically, no, um, anything that's going to be transmitting on Earth is going to overpower a satellite. So we're going to have interference easily. So if there's no clear framework that's going to prevent that, then that, that I think is the most dangerous thing for any kind of satellite application. No? So though it's great to have EO127 and other, other measures to promote satellite, if there's a lacking governing policy for the spectrum that is the lifeblood of this technology, um, it won't be able to do its best in uh, helping solve our problems. So yeah, uh, th th that's, that's all I really wanted to say. Thank you, Mr. Dabao. So I, I'm just curious, Sky Internet is a cable internet provider? Sky Cable is, yeah, cable TV and ISP. Yes. Okay. So, because they have many subscribers, uh, particularly in the NCR, and the fact that uh, the type of um, ISP is not sort of you know considered in the in the study. So, I mean, this is something. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That, that's why I mentioned that it's really important to capture cable, right? Because if if you don't uh, if I don't think anyone will answer Sky Cable as an ISP if you ask them uh, is there an ISP in your area, and I don't think it's natural for someone to say ah, yeah 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 it's, you don't see Sky Cable then no ISP on, mm -hmm. um, so yeah I agree with you that it really should be captured by the survey. That's right, and uh, yeah, that's part of the enhancement for the uh, uh, subsequent <laughs> survey. We hope. Uh, the ICT is uh, hearing us as we uh, as we hold this uh, conversation. Okay, Engineer Pear, sir, go ahead. Yeah, so uh, I'm going to I'm going to encapsulate all all of what was said into three basic uh, challenges for the satellite industry, as Mr. Ganapin re really points out. The first is the legislative framework. Definitely, we need open access and data transmission. Definitely, we need uh, satellite-based technologies for Internet Connectivity Act. Definitely, we need Spectrum Management Act. These mm -hmm. three basics. And uh, as mentioned also, the Public Service Act amendments because uh, the telco, uh, the, sorry, the satellite companies cannot sell to us directly 
if the Public Service Act is still going to uh, uh, prohibit them doing business with us directly. So those are the, those are four laws that already are getting in the way. The second is uh, regulatory enforcement. Uh, as correctly pointed out by Mr. Daba, uh, satellite signals are easily interfered with by whoever. And it's not just the telcos that interfere with you, by the way. They are also your uh, wireless IP cameras that are installed in traffic lights. They are also, uh, you know, those, those high-powered uh, access points that they use in stadiums. Things like that can get in the way. And that's why we need to have an NTC that's more responsive, not just something that they handle uh, interference on paper, but they actually, you know, sometimes they should go out and measure uh, interference in the field. Maybe there's a new transmitter that's already hurting the cable in cable TV industry, or maybe there's a new uh, there's a new company that's hurting uh, ordinary citizens using their Wi-Fi routers. That kind of interference is solved by a more uh, responsive en enforcement. Then finally, the third, which I think hasn't been mentioned yet, technology. Mm -hmm. The Philippines is a wet country. We're very, very wet. And because we're very, very wet, some technologies are not ideal for operation in the Philippines, such as the use of the KA band satellites or the KU band satellites. They, they suffer from rain attenuation or rain fade. So when it's cloudy or when it's raining or maybe it's just high humidity in the air, your signal is going to degrade. This is why, for example, low-lying cities in our in our country have less satellite uh, satellite quality of service than compared to the mountains, which have you know less humidity and have uh, less water in, getting in the way. So, uh, because of that, we need to we need to uh, encourage these of technologies like C band, which is currently what we're using in the country. But the C-band uh, frequency, we have narrowed it down so much that only about 400 megahertz is available to, to be used. Instead of being able, to, uh, being able to have it equitably distributed among all the possible users of it. So again, it goes back to those, to those fundamentals of having a policy environment that promotes 21st, IC, 21st century ICT and uh, a fair uh, a fair intervention of government when when it comes to uh, abuse of dominant uh, dominant market share thank you very much engineer pair okay let us now go to the question of uh, Sheila Mi Almasa of Minda and if i may direct this question to you uh, dr albert okay and he, he she is asking um what other proposed indicators what other indicators would you propose that um, uh, we should consider to monitor the improvement in ICT connectivity and addressing digital divide uh, that uh, should be uh, considered uh, in, in the subsequent um, uh, survey uh, tool so we can have a better, you know, come up with more uh, um, more complete data, more comprehensive data. Uh, yeah, Sheila, the, 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 the problem sometimes when you, ha when you have like, um, you know, surveys being written by, you know, first that the design of a survey is usually done by whoever is going to conduct it. <laughs> and, and in the case of uh, the ICT, you know, they, they probably just try to look through first uh, the regular household service done in other countries mm -hmm. because you don't, you you you, uh, but you don't necessarily think, hey, you know what what's what is what is standard in one country may may not necessarily may need to be contextualized, uh, because the, the the conditions may be a bit different. So, and and this is where it should be important that there should be some industry experts that should have been involved also in the preparation of the conduct of the survey. And I think this is sometimes the the what do you call this the uh, the barrier when it comes to government 
or, or agencies doing surveys. They tend to do it by themselves, and they don't they don't usually have uh, uh, mechanisms to invite uh, others to to participate. Even myself, I was never consulted <laughs> in this DICT survey. It just came. It was already finished, and then uh, can you do the analysis? You know, the, so this is the problem. Sometimes when you're doing a survey, first you have to think of why are you doing the survey, uh, because some information can actually be ac accessed without a survey. Mm. Uh, there, may be, there may be actually uh, ways for you to think of it from the supply side uh, and, and try to just, you know, get some specific information. So it, it's important for you to, to, to know first the landscape of data. Second is you also have to, to as I said, know how to even ask questions. What indicators indeed are important I myself right now, I can't really think of the specific set of indicators that would be important, but it will start off with some statistical standards first that are prescribed internationally. I mean, I, I would already criticize, as I already did this in, the, in, in our report, that you know, even for digital skills, I wouldn't even go as far as technology, but just digital skills. You know, for one of the indicators in SDG, an indicator in SDGs, they only adopted six out of the nine skills. You know, I said, oh my God, why did they, they only focus on the, on, on the six? And, and at that time, you know, when they were doing the survey, uh, there was already an, a discussion that maybe the, those, nine, those nine skills need to be changed because it was too attached to certain devices, you know? And, and so it, it was reframed now. There's an, a, 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 a committee uh, that was, that was an, there's an expert committee that was, uh, that was formed by the International Telecommunications Union uh, that actually talked about this. But again, you know, it wasn't, it di didn't seem to be something that they never, they, they actually thought of. So, you know, when you're doing all of this, especially in, in, a, in a topic that's ICT, that's where you know so many things happen so fast, you need to know the landscape. Um, I, I don't know, know the full landscape myself. You know, I'm, I myself, I would not consider myself an expert. I, I would be only thinking along the lines of statistics for measuring ICT, but I wouldn't know all the technologies myself. That's why we also have, we invited Grace to be part of the study because, you know, uh, Grace knows the, 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 the landscape far better than me when it comes to the, uh, uh, the, 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 the actual supply side uh, issues. So I, 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 I think, it's going to be important really for DICT to, I, as far as I know, they're going to conduct one on the next survey next year or the year after. That's already part of their plans. That's what they told us. So I'm glad uh, maybe somebody from DICT can verify this. But I'm, I'm, I, I think that's, that's the point here that when, when you prepare for a survey, know first the landscape, try to invite as many people, uh, you know, uh, who, who, can, who can give feedback. Don't, don't do it yourself because that's a recipe for disaster. Thank you very much, Toots. Okay, let us move to um, another question. And this time, this is from Giselle Laranas of Picard. Um, aside from physical slash material access and digital skills and training, another level of digital divide is empowerment. Uh, she is asking if we have a metric on this uh, level as well. Well, empowerment is a is a broad, broad concept and it, it has to be broken down into several indicators. But uh, um, Ms. Grace, uh, would you like to uh, give your thoughts on this? Actually, that's my first comment as well. Empowerment um, is, is very broad, no? how do you? Mm, that's right. Because if, um, there, there is a school of thought that says that if you provide the digital tools, that's already empowerment in itself. That's right. Mm -mm, mm -mm. Um, and in many cases, you, you cannot force to empower people. No, You have to give them the, the basic foundation and the skills, let's say, to use a computer or how to access the internet, and then they'll take it from there. So um, I guess in, in this case, empowerment would be first, let's give people, provide them the, you know, the basic tools, diba? Parang if we want people to use digital uh, technology to, to, to uh, uplift their lives, um, we have to, they have to have the, the, the necessary tools for that, the devices, the connection, 
as well as the um, uh, I wouldn't say education would be um, necessary, but you know the the digital skills, the basic digital skills, and then um, we and and hopefully they, these tools can be provided to them sustainably. Because sometimes no, that's the problem, no? If when there's a you know there's a project and then uh, people would have access to these tools. Tapos when the funding ends, um, then you know they 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 no longer have the basic um, you know equipment. So that's at, I think no one of the challenges. Um, how can people sustainably have access to these tools and mm -hmm. the le the learning in itself? No, how can they use that the learning from the digital tools and apply it? No, what is relevant to them? Um, again, forcing has never been a good, ano naman eh, a good way of teaching people, no? Or yeah, so that would be my comment. Thank you very much, Miss Grace. Uh, okay, Engineer Pierre, yeah, you have been working tirelessly in the area of, uh, you know, uh, ad ad advocating for uh, ICT rights and other, you know, stuff. So, would you like to um, uh, comment on this, sir? I think let's, ano, let, let's go back to absolute fundamentals first of all the united nations recognizes that our rights online are our rights offline so whatever rights that you enjoy uh in the real world like you have the right to be safe from a, from being uh from being a victim of a pickpocket you have the right to not be scammed online so there's that first we have to understand that our rights online are our rights offline so co corollarily, that means our constitutional rights in the real world are our constitutional rights online as well. Therefore, our right to associate with uh, with people uh, on uh, in the real world, right to form organizations or even to make friends, is also our rights in the online world. We have the right to associate in the online. What does this mean? Because we have that right, the constitution also says that uh, you have the right to associate. You also have the right to choose not to associate. And this is where empowerment is, right? Uh, empowerment here means you have the opportunity to access if you so choose. And that's it. That's what empowerment is. Are we providing our citizens the opportunity to access the internet if they want to access? Grace is right. We shouldn't force people to go online if they don't want to. There are many people who don't want to go online. There are many people who want to maintain uh, a life away from the digital space. And that's fine. That's a right protected by our constitution. So empowerment is measured by only one thing. What's the metric? That metric is the opportunity to access penetration. Are we already at 100% uh, citizen uh, opportunity to access or are we not there yet? That's the metric for empowerment. Okay, thank you for that, um, Engineer Pierre. Okay, Dr. Sese, I saw you nodding your head. Would you like to um, say something with regard to this question? Yeah, uh, I would just like to what uh, to agree on what Pierre said that uh, empowerment is uh, essentially the power to choose whether you want to have the access or not. Uh, and this is something what we have noticed as well because uh, especially when working with uh, indigenous communities, because there are some communities that would want to maintain that uh, their their level, uh, their, their current state right now, that they're contented with it. Uh, and this is where uh, prep conversing uh, with the communities that is uh, becomes very much important. So that uh, remember when we have to bring in, when we are bringing in technology such as uh, connectivity, uh, Essentially, we are changing also the landscape or the, the community as a, as a whole. And whether that's for good or for bad, that's something that is in a way beyond our control and something that we cannot control. And uh, we also have to protect uh, not just their right for uh, access, but also their right, their right for their uh, things like cultural heritage, for example, mm -hmm. if they want to maintain that. And this is, right. and I think this is something that in any, uh, technological intervention that is being done in communities has to be taken into account. It's not just, we, we always have this perspective that if we are bringing in technology, we are already improving their lives. But in some cases, that's not the case. 
in some cases, we are disrupting their lives and um, we are making them more prone for exploitation and things like that. So we have to be very uh, culturally sensitive uh, on that aspect. And uh, that's where social preparation actually plays a very important role. I remember when we were doing our first, our, one of our sites, we really have had to talk to the elders of the community of the IP group that whether this is something that they are okay with. And if they said no, then okay, that's it. That's the end of the conversation. We won't force it on them because at the end of the day, it's 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 their right, it's their right to say no. And we cannot impose uh whatever what the technology that we are bringing into these communities. And uh, that's why we have to be very careful of that. And we have a lot of IP communities that uh, that has that are at risk whenever we have technological interventions. Thank you very much for stressing that point, uh, Dr. Sessa. Okay, uh, we have uh, another question here from Sheila May Almasa of Ninda, and I think this is uh, uh, very relevant um, considering the additional uh, budget uh, that our LGUs will will be getting next year in light of the uh, implementation of the Mandanas Garcia ruling. And she said, what would you propose that LGUs consider in their planning to provide more connectivity and data access uh, towards addressing digital divide in their locality? And any, and, uh, any idea how and who should they coordinate with further? Okay. Um, Mr. Uh, Daba, sir, would you like to? Uh, Maybe very biased of my answer. <laughs> um, for the LGUs that have more budget, I strongly suggest you talk to your local provider and discuss uh, how they can serve you best by rolling out infrastructure on your behalf. And of course, the best part is they'll service it for you. Uh, it's my firm belief that the government you know, shouldn't enter into businesses that they're not uh, primarily doing. Uh, the government isn't a telco, so it shouldn't be doing internet services. Contract it out to guys that are doing it. And, uh, you know, hopefully they do, they deliver a service that uh, makes you happy. Um, you'll, you'll probably find that a lot of schools and faraway places and a lot of government offices are already connected to smaller players. So uh, enhancing that connectivity to deliver better services and getting uh, the higher uh, throughput you need for the more technologically sophisticated services like connecting to Pagasa and all, and all of these other things. Uh, that, that's what I think the LGU should be doing if, uh, if connectivity is the number one thing they want to do with their uh, new budget. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Daba. Okay, we are down to our um, uh, last, uh, last two questions. Unfortunately, uh, we don't have much um sufficient time left but uh, um we have some questions here actually directed to um the dict and uh we uh sent these questions to them unfortunately uh no one um in the dict right now are available to answer them but uh, perhaps um you may have some insights uh given your some of you have been directly coordinating with the dict um, Arnold Harlan from the Cavite Third uh, uh, District Engineering Office, is there a plan or program to improve ICT infrastructure and interconnectivity in or between agencies of the government? And if there is, how will it be done? I believe that the ICT has uh, this uh, national broadband plan and the specifics of this, uh, perhaps uh, some of you, one of you can, can uh, you know, can I uh, share with us? Uh, okay, yes. Thank you very much. Inge um, sorry, Engineer Peer. Go ahead, sir. This ties to the earlier question eh, uh, about what what LGUs can do. In fact, um, the answer to that really, the, the base question is two things. Number one, what are your needs? Do you understand what your needs are, right? Before you need to talk about bringing technology in, you know, what are you going to use the technology for? Do you even know what you're going to, what you're bringing it in for? Are you going to bring it only for schools? Are you bringing it to empower your farmers so that they can uh, communicate with uh, 
with sellers here in Metro Manila? Are you empowering your, your fisher folks so that they have real-time weather? Do you understand your needs? That's your first. Number two, your next step is uh, your LGU must, must be capacitated, especially in, the, in the, uh, your local council, because your local council will be voting on the ordinances, will be voting on the budget. You'll be voting about where are you going to put your money? We live in a we live in a world where uh, if a business will smell money coming out of your LGU, they will run to you. Therefore, you need to have ICT champions even in your LGUs in your council, so that you know that you will you will be very strict on how your monies will be spent. And the third thing is, uh, so, so you already you already know what your LGUs needs are. You have uh, ICT champions in in your LGU who are guiding your guiding the implementation. The third step is, uh, uh, as as Joel said, uh, bringing in the small players. Why am I saying this? Because they're already there. Why are you going to call for players who are in the capital when you have already uh, ISPs that are already operating in your place? And if you don't have any, there are worldwide best practices such as community mesh networks or community ISPs or in, uh, in a few places that we know. We know about community cat days, 100 subscribers only. But, you know, that whole village, they have the probably the best internet in their country because, you know, they're only serving 100 people. There are so many uh, op uh, options uh, available to us because of the emerging technologies, even of legacy technologies, but we have to stick to those three. You need to know what you want. You need to know what you need it for. Uh, you need to have champions in your LGU. Do not, please, do not have LGU officials who will say, we don't know that, nakakatakot yan, uh, don't bleed ang technology. No, you need them to be 21st century empowered. That's important, and so that's why the elections are important. Okay. Thank you very much, Engineer Pierre. Okay, question from uh, Maria Giselle Cruz. Uh, during this COVID-19 uh, period, how do we step up government capital and development agencies spending to help business communities, particularly MSMEs, from the economic fallout? How can ICT support procurement process to provide direct boost and generate support to MSMEs? Anyone from you who would like to answer this question? So how do we step up government capital and development agencies spending to help business communities, particularly MSMEs from the economic fallout? As, as um, far as I know, there are already a number of uh, development community partners who are actually uh, mm -hmm. helping. I know UNDP has a specific set of programs uh, under their, their the, the, the current uh, country program uh, document uh, to actually help. They, they've retrofit because they know that, uh, you know, there's so many problems for MSMEs trying to survive, trying to retrofit. So even development community and even government, I mean, to, has been retrofitting because mm -hmm. of all of the problems caused by the pandemic. So I think uh, the only thing is how the question is, because remember, we have 99% of firms as MSME, so it's it's kind of hard. I remember, uh, you know, uh, my our good, very good friend, uh, the uh, you know, Peter Aldaba of, of of the DTI, wanting to help all uh, as many because everybody was going to her and asking for help, and and sometimes it's just overwhelming, you know. So uh, unfortunately, it's not easy sometimes to take to to pick who who are the uh, the, the the MSMEs you will help and and in what priority. So it, uh, we just have to wait a little bit longer and maybe maybe whoever wins next year <laughs> maybe you know if we if we choose the right leaders we'll <laughs> we'll help the msmes i don't know let's just hope okay wow what a lively discussion we just had okay so to cap our conversation i may ask each speaker for their uh, from some brief final uh remarks um Okay, starting from you two, it's to be followed by Grace, then our uh, discussants. 
Yeah, well, for me, the the whole point about, I mean, I was very excited to work with this National ICT Household Survey because at least it's going to have a, a picture from the household side and from uh, the individuals within the household, how exactly people are using you know, and our, our, our uh, ICT. Uh, we know that ICT is part of an entire landscape and the innovation landscape, and we're not in the frontiers, unfortunately, of uh, across countries. We're we're lagging behind in many, many things, but uh, that's a, that's a good thing too because it gives us opportunities to be better. The only question is, would we want to be better? Are we actually making steps towards making ourselves better, whether in terms of putting the the right uh, you know, infrastructure around? Are we selecting the right leaders who will make those investments? Are we making the right mo uh, ways to, to improve ourselves also to become better digitally skilled? Because, uh, you know, uh, uh, th th those are so many things that we have to consider. So the, the ball is up to us. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Albert. Ms. Grace? Yes, yes. Yeah. Um, my, my, my message would be very simple that I hope we will have more of the national ICT household surveys. We really do hope that it can be sustained, it can be improved, and that um, the DICT, uh, you know, the leadership of the DICT would push for evidence based policy making. Uh, because this survey will not be of any value to any of us if the results would not be used to actually make changes. And um, the the second point that I'd like to make is that um, you, the you know uh, gathering of um, local data, official local data, is very important. No mapping out the gaps um, in terms of digital infrastructure will is a the good first step towards um you know making the right decisions and i agree with sir toots let's choose the right leaders <laughs> okay thank you very much miss grace um dr says this, sir uh I'll, I'll take a quote from galileo galilei that uh measure what you can be me what can be measured and what uh, make measurable what cannot be measured and uh, the nicths uh, is a step towards that. We need to know. Uh, it's a it's a step towards uh, knowing what uh, what the current landscape is, and of course uh, we have to look at the. Uh, and this is something that needs to be continued uh, probably in a couple of years time, so that we can see how far we have progressed or regressed. We, uh, we don't know yet. Hopefully progressed. Uh, and at the same time, we also have to look at uh, the access to connectivity or connectivity itself as a catalyst for uh, inclusive and sustainable socioeconomic development. Uh, it's something that can change the landscape of a, of a community uh, if they want to. Uh, we have to very, we have to uh, put that caveat that uh, there are communities that uh, would, uh, would, not, would not like to remain uh, uh, where they are right now. But also we have to look at uh, not just from the infrastructure perspective, uh, oh well, before that, uh, we have to utilize the technologies that are available to us right now. There's a lot of technology, satellite, cable, internet, and so on. And it's, uh, it's, it's there for us to use. It's here for us to use, okay? Uh, and, but then we have to look at it also in a way, it's not just about bringing in infrastructure, but also bringing in, uh, cou coupling it with programs that can maximize the utilization of these infrastructure so that it doesn't go to waste, uh, maximizing it for education, for health, for commerce, for governance, and so on. And uh, hopefully we'll have, uh, with the right leaders in the next uh, election, we'll have, uh, we can see a lot of uh, reforms, uh, policy reforms in terms of that would really open up our telecommunication sector. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Sese. Okay, uh, doc, uh, Mr. Uh, Dabao, sir, final, final words? Yes, uh, today was great, and I think it bodes well for us that uh, we have a DICT that's asking the questions and they're tapping uh, organizations like uh, PIDS to look at the answers and uh, help us establish uh, what we know and just as importantly, what we don't know. And we can make decisions uh, based on that. And hopefully uh, we will have more surveys that will allow us to have more data and to help the government craft more policies that will help close the digital divide. No? Um, the, the, the last thing I'm going to say is just I hope that, uh, I hope that 
the outcome of all of these of all of this data is that we create an enabling environment where players, both big and small, can do their part in helping bridge the digital divide. Um, and to echo what everyone said, uh, vote wisely. Thanks. Okay. Uh, oh, of course, last but not the least, uh, sir. Uh, okay. Remember, everyone, and this is this is the valuable this is the valuable thing that PIDS and the DICT brought today through the National ICT Household Survey. We have baseline data for for our ICT ecosystem, but let's remember that the ICT ecosystem must be governed with the anchors of rights, governance, development, and security. So that it's holistic, right? We just shouldn't just be looking at technology. We should also be looking at ourselves. We shouldn't be only looking at national. We we must remember that our LGUs affect our daily lives and also in terms of ICT, and therefore vote wisely, not just in the national level, but in the LGU level. Thanks, everyone. And thank you to Engineer Gala. Okay, friends, um, please join me in thanking all our speakers, Dr. Jose Ramon Albert and his co-authors, um, Dr. Res uh, Rohel Sessa Engineer, Pierre Gala, Mr. Uh, Jobel Dabao, and uh, of course, uh, Ms. Mary Grace, uh, Mirandilia uh, Santos for their valuable insights. Let us give all of them a well-deserved uh, big virtual clap. Okay, so friends, we do hope our conversation today has uh, provided a greater clarity of the gaps in in ICT uh, use and development that we are we are facing as a nation which all of these will exacerbate existing inequalities if left uh, unaddressed. The ongoing pandemic has demonstrated the importance of good ICT access and a decent level of digital literacy skills as we transition to distance learning, work from home, online payment, e-commerce, and even telemedicine. And um, these are areas that re still remain inaccessible to certain groups to many regions due to the dig digital divide. And our speakers have discussed some ways forward and we hope that what they have shared with us will guide our policymakers and concerned agencies in reforming up outdated policies and improving ICT programs, um, our data collection, uh, monitoring and monitoring um, in promoting greater use of ICT for development and in taking advantage of innovative technologies to reach the last mile. Okay, before we finally close, I would like to announce the winners of our poll. Okay, they are uh, Raymond Tejano, Alice Laborte, and Jeremiah Chor uh, Miranda. Uh, Raymond Tejano, Alice Laborte, and Jeremiah Chor Miranda, uh, you won in our poll for uh, this webinar. Um, the webinar team will get in touch with you for your for the, the delivery of your prize. Okay, so and finally, we would like uh, we have some reminders. So you can access all the presentations from the PIDS uh, website, including the um, the presentations, including the comments of our discussions. Okay, please answer the feedback survey that will pop on your screen after this webinar. We will also email you the link after the event. Your comments are important to us to improve our webinars. And please uh, visit our website and social media pages uh, regularly. And thanks uh, again to all our Facebook uh, followers and those who uh, tune in to our um, Twitter account for the uh, uh, live tweets, for the highlights of this event. Okay, and finally, we have the following webinars for um, the remaining two weeks of November. We have on November 18, our webinar on examining the health impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic in the Philippines. And on November 25, our webinar on assessing the Philippines' performance in meeting the ASEAN Economic Community Vision 2025. And finally, we would like to acknowledge the various organizations from the government, academe, 
civil society, business, and international development community, and also from the media who joined us today. Maraming salamat po. So this concludes our webinar for this week. Stay safe, stay healthy, and stay informed too. Thank you and enjoy the rest of your day. See you next week. Bye. Thank you, Thank you. everyone. Maraming salamat. Ingat po tayong lahat.